At 34 years old, Kim Jong-un is one of the youngest world leaders alive today, and he's certainly by far the most infamous, but what makes him so terrifying? Today, we'll take a look at some of the cruelest things he's done. In this episode of the Infographic Show, how brutal is Kim Jong-un? In 2011, the world was formally introduced to Kim Jong-un, the third dynastic ruler of North Korea since 1950. Kim's cruelty started almost as soon as he assumed power. Faced with the specter of a possible coup from within the ranks of the nation's top political and military elite, Kim Jong-un immediately began a political purge that is rumored to have killed dozens of senior officials. In his bid to consolidate power and prevent any challenge to his authority, he even went so far as to have his own uncle executed, and years later, paranoia concerning his half-brother led him to dispatch assassins to Kuala Lumpur in 2017. But political purges are simply par for the course concerning Kim's cruelty. His real crimes against humanity are committed on a daily basis against his own citizens. Wait until you hear about the laws they must follow and the penalties they incur for breaking them. The hallmark of North Korean cruelty is known as the Three Generations Rule, established in 1972 by Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-un's grandfather. The Three Generations Rule mandates that any serious crime warrants punishing not just the offender, but three generations of his or her family as well. This is, according to Kim Il-sung, the only way to exterminate the seed of evil completely. What this means is that in North Korea, if your father committed a grave crime against the state, you and your children would also be sent to a prison camp alongside him for the rest of your life. The three generations rule is supposed to be only for great offenses, but testimony from North Korean defectors and escapees shows that it has been enacted for offenses from political dissent to failing to remove dust from a portrait of any of the Kim ruling family members. Conditions inside the labor camps are purposefully cruel as well, with prisoners being fed barely enough to stay alive and forced to try to catch rats and insects to eat. Survivors have described 12-hour hard labor workdays, seven days a week, with people becoming physically stunted and deformed from the unceasing work. Beatings, torture, and rape are all commonplace in these camps, and there exists no possibility of parole. North Korea's constitution technically guarantees freedom of the press, but the state does not allow any foreign or non-state sponsored media to operate. It is therefore technically illegal to operate any independent press, and this is a law that Kim's North Korea enforces strictly. All foreign media is completely banned from the nation, making it illegal to watch foreign TV shows or movies, listen to foreign radio or music, or even read foreign books. While North Korea does have a state-run version of the internet that is open to all citizens, government permission is first needed to own a computer, and only state-approved content is available. Occasionally, outside websites are made available, but they are heavily censored after being downloaded and hosted locally. Violating any of North Korea's media rules is met with strict punishment with either execution or imprisonment in a forced labor camp. North Korea's constitution also technically guarantees freedom of religion, but Kim Jong-un's government is extremely hostile to the idea of any religion, and the practice of it is banned by law. In its place is a national ideology of Juche, a hybrid fusion of Marxism and Korean nationalism created by Kim Il-sung. Juche states that man is the master of his own destiny and that the North Korean masses are to act as masters of their revolution and in the construction of their own socialist state. The Juche ideology preaches strong nationalism and self-reliance, but makes no mention of any divine creator or other spiritual entities. Wary of what the Kim family believes to be corrupting Western influences, all other religions are banned in North Korea, and anyone caught practicing any other religion faces immediate imprisonment, often with the dreaded Three Generations Rule in effect. Kim Jong-un has also continued his father and grandfather's practice of tightly controlling the movement of its own citizens. It is illegal in North Korea to leave the country without official permission, which is almost never granted. While thousands of defectors and refugees still attempt to flee across the border into China or through the heavily mined DMZ into South Korea, they do so knowing that their families they leave behind will likely be punished in their absence. Even those that manage to successfully escape, though, are still not safe, as North Korea has for a long time conducted international abductions and forced repatriations of escaped citizens. North Koreans in Japan, South Korea, China, and even as far as Europe have all been the target of North Korean abduction squads who force the individual back home under threat of violence. Sometimes they even drug them and smuggle them back home. Once returned, you guessed it, they face execution or forced imprisonment, where they will likely join whatever family they left behind in a forced labor camp. 
But pregnant women who are captured and repatriated face yet another of Kim's horrors, his belief in complete racial purity and Korean superiority. If a woman becomes pregnant while abroad, the child is killed, and if she is returned home pregnant, she's forced to have an abortion. One report from an escaped North Korean told of a woman in a hospital who gave birth only to have the baby immediately smothered to death. Kim Jong-un's government preaches self-reliance, yet it is completely unable to meet the needs of its own people. In its place, a black market has sprung up, and often it is the only place that food and medicine can be found. Yet Kim has continued his father and grandfather's abolishment of a free market system, so any private enterprise is completely banned in the nation. Those caught dealing smuggled goods or trying to start up their own business are imprisoned, though it is a well-known fact that corruption is so rampant among North Korea's police and military that most officials will look the other way in exchange for a hefty bribe. Theft, however, is still harshly dealt with, even things that would seem petty to you and I. In 2016, 21-year-old American college student Otto Warmbier, on a sponsored tour of the nation, stole a propaganda poster off his hotel's wall and was caught. His sentence was 15 years of hard labor for trying to harm the motivation and work ethic of the Korean people. Though he was released to the US 17 months later, Warmbier suffered severe brain trauma by then, likely due to severe torture and starvation, and died days later. In North Korea, your freedom, everything from what you watch, read, or even where you can work, is severely restricted, and there exists no due process. The country is ruled completely and absolutely through the brutality of Kim Jong-un alone, who fears dissent so much that he is willing to go to extreme lengths to prevent it. While you may occasionally get annoyed by the rules and laws in your own country, at least give thanks that, safe at home, you don't face the possibility of getting sent, along with your entire family, to prison for failing to dust the portrait of your country's ruler. What would your life be like if you were born in North Korea? It's kind of hard for those of us on the outside to imagine. The country's official media present a bizarre picture of impossibly loyal, leader-adoring ranks of civilians and military alike. To some extent, Western media replay those images without enough skepticism for the stagey propaganda. For viewers outside the control of that secretive state, however, the glimpses convey the opposite of their intended effect. Instead of happy socialist cadres, the people depicted come across as an undifferentiated, freakish mass. And rather than focusing on human interest features, Western news stories now tend to show a rocket blasting off, perhaps followed by a map graphic showing the missile's potential radius. None of that has much to do with daily life in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, as the isolated country is officially known. Even though the military and the Workers' Party of Korea remain central institutions, the focus of daily life for most North Koreans has nothing to do with politics or war. The government was once literally revered in the figures of Kim Jong-il, and especially the nation's founding father Kim Il-sung. Now the state is something of an economic means to an end at best, and more often an unavoidable annoyance, not to mention a continuing object of fear. For a generation now, most North Koreans have lived experiences that demonstrate the patent lies of the state media. They just have to be careful who they admit it to. There was a time when everyone in North Korea made their living working for the government, and many were happy to do it. In the 1950s, the DPRK's economy was actually stronger than that of their rival, US-allied South Korea. During the days of Japanese colonization, the northern part of the peninsula was modernized for heavy industry. The South, with more favorable agricultural conditions, started off their independent era with less industrial infrastructure. In the 1960s and 70s, North Korea continued along in economic security as their neighbors in China struggled to emerge from years of deadly famine. By the 1980s, the equipment, factories, railways, and power grid that North Korea depended on was aging, as was the case in many communist countries of the era. Pretty much everyone was poor, but few were genuinely destitute. And then the bottom fell out. The prevailing philosophy during the long reign of Kim Il-sung was juche, or self-reliance. It was a matter of pride that North Koreans were in control of their own economic destiny, growing and manufacturing most of what they needed domestically. Without a doubt, the people of North Korea were incredibly industrious, but what the country's leader didn't mention was the incredible amount of support that poured in the country from China and the Soviet Union. Trading goods at a loss amounted to an indirect subsidy from neighboring giants. Most crucially, North Korea's fuel supply depended upon assistance from the USSR. And when quite suddenly there was no USSR anymore, North Korea was in trouble. 
The loss of foreign trade and the fuel shortage in the early 1990s started a literal death spiral for the people of North Korea. Factory production slowed. Without sufficient fertilizers or machinery, farm production slumped. There was now simply less food to go around. In those days, wages were supplemented with direct food distribution by the state. That stopped. Raw materials stopped reaching factories, and workers, left with nothing to do, were now also receiving virtually no compensation. Production of everything basically halted, and people began to starve. Many of the experiences of ordinary North Koreans in this time of destitution and during the era of radical economic change that followed are taken from North Korea Confidential by Daniel Tudor and James Pearson, who show ways that the close society has found some openings, and Barbara Demick's Nothing to Envy, which chronicles the lives of people in North Korea's far northeastern industrial region. Demick's stories, in turn, come in large part from defectors who lived through the misery. What little residual momentum was left in North Korea's state-run economy effectively died when poor growing conditions in the mid-1990s caused massive crop failures. Now, even the last vestiges of public food distribution ended. Hospitals filled with the sick and starving, and then they emptied. Those who were growing their own small gardens, the only form of private production allowed, had a little bit of a buffer, but that was no help to city dwellers. Stories of people eating tree bark and grass in those days are no exaggeration. Those who could do so hunted wild animals until they became a rarity. People scraped food out of bilge and animal dung. Exaggerated rumors raised the specter of cannibalism among the country's already suffering public. Foreign aid came in, but the regime refused to allow aid groups to distribute it themselves. Incompetence may have played some role in the poor allocation, but part of the problem was certainly a callous undervaluation of the lives of some citizens. The policy under Kim Jong-il was Songgun, or military first. Those who were considered important to the state and its defense might live, others were on their own. A low estimate for the number of deaths in the North Korean famine of the 1990s is 240,000, but it may have been as high as 600,000. The higher figure would represent a staggering 10% of the population. In a reference to a well-known story of Kim Il-sung's alleged victory over the Japanese in World War II, the era of economic depression in the 1990s became known as the Arduous March. It was in those days of misery among the ruins of the command economy that an unusual form of capitalism sprouted up. As a corollary to the acceptance of kitchen gardens, beginning in the 1980s, the regime reluctantly granted people the right to trade produce at outdoor neighborhood markets, known as Zhang Madang. At the height of the famine, for many, an informal Zhang Madang in one's village or neighborhood might be the only place to obtain food. People developed a system of bartering. It was illegal to sell newly manufactured products in an informal market, but people would bring in secondhand goods, and people with different skill sets would offer increasing range of services, like bicycle repair and hairstyling. Somehow bags of rice from aid shipments found their way into the market stalls, and people were glad to buy this most valued commodity when they could, despite the specific ban on selling rice. In fact, as the Zhang Madan expansion was going into the late 1990s, aside from the original garden vegetables, the whole thing was illegal. But there was nothing the government could do about it, since there was no alternative that could put food on people's tables. Beginning sometime around 2002, the DPRK leadership made legal recognition of the market's official policy. Vendors could receive approval to operate in exchange for a fee. For large sellers, this licensure was worth the cost, and they no longer needed to fear arrest or seizure of their merchandise. The receipts also provided the dead-broke state with a source of revenue. By the mid-2010s, the largest of the markets had become veritable superstores, with stalls spread over many acres, and products and services ranging from electronics, household appliances, motorcycles, car batteries, pharmaceuticals, and eventually even livestock. From the start, most of the vendors were middle-aged and older women, for a variety of reasons. Men have always made up the large majority of North Korea's military, which is huge. As a side note, it's among the world's largest fighting forces. Only China, the US, India, and possibly Russia have more soldiers and sailors, and all three have vastly larger populations and economies. De facto male conscription applies to the large majority of men, whereas only one-tenth as many women are recruited. In the 1990s, the standard term of military military service grew to 10 years, and with grim job perspectives elsewhere, joining and staying in the army was for many young men the best deal on offer. 
Culturally, buying and selling goods was viewed as an undesirable job, and in the 1980s and 90s, women continued to have lower social status than men in North Korea. Additionally, food insecurity tends to kill adult men faster than adult women, based on natural body fat percentages, and in 2015, Kim Jong-un removed age restrictions on women marketers, while banning men under 60 from operating stalls. One result of markets run largely by women is a general rise in opportunity, a greater economic centrality for women in the income of families. Most people in the civilian sector still had day jobs, and those were still with the government, but by the early 2000s, most jobs paid far less than one needed to survive. This fact led to a second major economic restructuring. The reality was that you would likely have to make your living doing something other than your official job. Depending upon where you lived and your social standing, that could take various forms. By now, the state was effectively mandating that people grow their own food. Even soldiers spent a good deal of their time farming. If you were already working on a collective farm, you might sneak off to some marginal land to grow your own crops on the side. At first, this practice was likewise illegal, but utterly rational if you were looking at starvation as the alternative. In time, the government eased up on this issue too, allowing farm workers to cultivate some land for their own families, as long as they also hit their public quota. On a larger scale, people in positions of power began to start quasi-private companies. At a time when productivity couldn't be lower, managers were given permission to get creative in making money. International trade, particularly with China, became an important source of revenue for several government departments. Although the use of foreign currency was, as with so many other aspects of this new economy, illegal, in reality everyone knew that you needed Japanese yen, US dollars, and Chinese yuan to effectively keep operations moving. Around 2009, the DPRK made one last serious attempt to curtail privatization of the economy. The North Korean government effectively devalued their currency, which, like South Korea's, is called the won, although they're completely separate. The act of re-denominating North Korea's currency wiped out the savings of many of the newly minted black market success stories and was incredibly unpopular among this increasingly prominent class. The government backpedaled and ended its last serious crackdown on the informal economy. The official in charge of that monetary scheme was executed. It's an open secret that an official caste system determines much of your lot in life in the DPRK. Everyone is classified into one of three major strata, called Songbon. Basically, people are considered either loyal, indifferent, or hostile to the regime. That sounds straightforward enough, but it gets worse. Songbon is inherited. If your parents had low status, you do too. Nobody tells you, but you figure it out. For example, you might ace an entrance exam into a university, but get shut out. If you're a young woman, a guy you like might avoid you for fear of losing status. Because although you can't quite get yourself into a higher songbun, if the government finds out you're doing something questionable, you can get knocked to a lower level. At the highest social strata, you're exempted from military service and more or less guaranteed a high status job. On the other hand, people at the very lowest status aren't trusted with much of anything and can't even qualify for military service. The majority the majority of males do have to enlist, with evaluations starting around age 14 and training for those accepted beginning at age 17. There are minimum height and weight requirements too, but in the wake of an era of widespread malnutrition, those rules have necessarily been loosened. Going to university lets you defer enlistment, and depending upon the job you get out of college, you might be able to avoid the draft altogether. But again, university acceptance is partly based on your social class, and even more so, the course of your study you might enter. Party membership is likewise a function of your songbun. And so, in another irony, there aren't any members of the working class in the Korean Workers' Party. In principle, this has something to do with the supposed class standing of your ancestors in the pre-independence era, but those alleged justifications have no relationship at all to the power structure of the last three generations. High-status jobs as scientists, doctors, university professors, government officials, and the like require high songbun. On the other hand, in the world of the informal economy, class standing has much less importance. True, to manage one of the new major corporate enterprises, you have to start off in a position of wealth or power, but to succeed at the level of the Zhang Madang, you pretty much just have to hustle and probably pay some bribes. A natural offshoot of marketing homegrown produce is selling your home-cooked food. 
To the extent that ingredients were available, preparing food for sale at a Zhangmadang was a logical cottage industry, as was the bulk processing of raw ingredients like flour to fill the niche left by the shuttered state apparatus. At home, manufacturing of everyday products like shoes met other desperate needs for one's neighbors, and increasingly once unavailable imported foods like oranges and pineapples started showing up at the markets. The famine was ending for two reasons, one grim and the other hopeful. First, after so many deaths, there were just fewer mouths to feed. But now, there was also a functioning system in place to produce and distribute food. Although it involved risk, there wasn't much left to lose. One of the key elements of the informal economy is smuggling. The border with South Korea is ridiculously well guarded, so that's a non-starter. But the Chinese border to the north is pretty porous, if you know how and where to cross. In the modern system, border guards effectively count on bribes from smugglers as a major part of their salary. All manner of product pours in. Foreign fashions are quite popular as are South Korean films and TV shows. As memory sticks replace DVDs as the medium of choice for banned content, censors are increasingly unable to stem the flow. Even soldiers in North Korea enjoy watching South Korean movies, albeit discreetly. Young women in the northern region have taken to wearing black jeans, which are less obvious than blue jeans, if technically still illegal. South Korean brands are more highly valued than Chinese, in another upending of the traditional party line. Millions of North Koreans own cell phones on the country's own internal network, but if you live near the border and want to talk to people outside the country, you can buy an illegal Chinese phone and pick up their signal from across the river. Increasingly, people are finding ways to communicate outside the eyes of the censors. The state puts limits on domestic travel, and you're supposed to get permission before going on a trip. That's become less of an obstacle now that there are so many private bus and truck operators. Since trains are unreliable almost to the point of being non-existent in much of the country, the new buses are about the only option anyway. A second and even more important function of these vehicles is the transportation of goods, licit or otherwise, around the country for distribution in the thriving markets. As with much of the economy, this system depends upon greased palms. Bribes have become so much a part of daily life that they've effectively become more of a system of taxation than any real threat of punishment for low-level economic crimes. Lower officials in turn have to hand some of their take up the ladder. At the bottom of the system, small vendors who operate at the margins of the official markets or in unofficial rural sites sometimes don't even bother to bribe anyone. When Kim Jong-un came to power in 2011, he revised his father's military first position to a new dual focus, basically nuclear weapons and the economy. These were at odds, since the sanctions from the international community in response to North Korea's nuclear weapons program were a drain on civilian sector development. But the new Kim also took a much more tolerant stance toward unofficial privatization. By now, entire government agencies were themselves profiting from capitalist enterprises, and the fact that this was in large part black market activity somewhat insulated them from international censure. There was never an official declaration, but cues from prominent officials displaying rich clothes and cars were a tacit invitation to increasing boldness from the nouveau rich. Pyongyang had a way to go, but the DPRK leadership clearly wanted it to compete with the luster of Seoul. Massive building projects in the capital became a priority. Lately, Kim Jong-un has made the development of resorts in the mountains and by the sea the focus of a huge push, since tourism is a sector less affected by international international sanctions. If all this is starting to sound like the bad times may be ending, that's not quite the case, at least so far. The labor for the ambitious construction projects is effectively slavery. One of the major functions of the military is to serve as free construction labor. The hours are long and the work is brutally hard and sometimes unsafe. Food is meager, although it seems to be better than what soldiers on other bases are given to eat, which is nothing. Officers receive meals, although their families do not. Common soldiers are expected to grow their own food, or failing that, to forage. This creates bad relations with people in neighboring towns, since the resulting practice is for soldiers to steal from civilian homes. Recently, soldiers have crossed the border to go on looting trips to nearby villages in China. In one extreme case, a soldier who was seriously ill fled on foot across the demilitarized zone to South Korea taking multiple gunshots in the process. Women in the North Korean military have found institutionalized rape and sexual abuse from higher-ranking officers and political advisors. An officially announced crackdown has yet to end this ugly variation on the culture of kickbacks and extortion. The harsh conditions faced by rank-and-file military are another inversion from the past, when that sector was the most valued part of the state. One exception to the trend is the group called Bureau 121, an elite group of hackers in the military, chosen young for special computer training and tasked with cyber warfare. 
This capability is considered especially important and so its soldiers are well compensated. Being a civilian doesn't necessarily exempt you from forced labor. To support the rapid building campaigns, military-style shock troops of ordinary citizens are also pressed into service through levels of coercion. Regular industries have a chain of command akin to military structure, with employees belonging to fixed work groups. The units serve various purposes, disseminating official information, enforcing ideological conformity or at least lip service to it, and of course meeting production quotas. The workgroup bosses, therefore, can pretty much order people to join the ad hoc construction crews, regardless of whether the group is ostensibly doing construction elsewhere, operating machinery in a factory, or any other work. If you can afford a bribe, you can avoid heading out to the months-long construction project. To fill the shortfall created by those who can dodge conscription into a work gang, managers are reportedly going to extreme measures, including child labor. Food insecurity has begun looming again as a possible catastrophe. The government's agricultural department is more aware now of what should be done to prevent it, namely better crop yields through fertilizer and farm equipment. But that doesn't change the fact that needed infrastructure is still lacking. Lots of people still plow their fields walking behind an ox. Meager resources by definition prevent a stockpile of grain for an emergency, so the nation stumbles on hand to mouth year by year. General supply shortages have lately been hurting businesses in the neighborhood markets. Many people aren't willing to wait around to see how it turns out this time. A steady stream of defectors make their way out of North Korea every year. To do so requires not only the emotional investment of leaving your home, but a substantial pile of cash as well. So the people who are in the best positions to leave are not the desperately poor, but those who have managed to save some earnings from opportunities in the informal economy. The kind of human smuggling assistance you get varies depending upon your budget. A basic fee gets you across the border, and from there you have to find your way to Mongolia or Vietnam, and from there back around to South Korea. High-end smugglers will plan a complete itinerary for you with the necessary connections and bribes along the way to allow for a much shorter trip. South Korea welcomes all defectors from the north, and there are programs that help you get started in your new life. It won't be totally unknown since you've been watching South Korean TV for years and receiving quiet intel from trusted associates back home. And then the cycle can perpetuate itself. There's of course no official way to send money from south of the DMZ, but a substitute banking system allows defectors to send quite a bit of money back to North Korea, relative to the small size of the economy. Chinese nationals living in the DPRK are often helpful in this regard, while North Korean citizens near the northern border have to be somewhat discreet when using a Chinese cell phone. Chinese citizens can use the foreign phones openly. They'll get a call from a colleague in South Korea, transfer the amount paid by the sender, less a transaction fee into their own account, and hand cash to the recipient. A similar system aids phone calls between the countries, reinforcing the growing information flow from person to person about the outside world. But despite cracks in the information wall, the totalitarian regime of the DPRK remains firmly in power with no sign of going anywhere. Political dissent is entirely forbidden and severely punished, as high-ranking officials grow rich off of bribes and the tier below them enter an upper middle class, their best bet is with the status quo. After all, it's the tacit government tolerance of the unofficial economic system that's gotten them where they are, both in terms of social rank and business opportunities. Backlashes against individuals are all always a possibility. Despite a trend toward freer dress codes, a prominent Pyongyang resident who crosses the invisible line into something too showy may face reprisal, and for more serious perceived political offenses, sentences of hard labor, prison, and execution remain common. So for now, North Koreans live out an inherent contradiction. They have to obey the law and voice support for a broken economic system, but they can only survive by working outside of it. Even though it's been seven years since he assumed power, Kim Jong-un remains an enigmatic figure. In North Korea, he is revered as almost godlike thanks to the state ideology of Juche. In the Western world, however, he is viewed much differently. He has been described as a nuclear lunatic in one news article and an overweight madman with a funny haircut in another. What is he really like, though? And what is it like to rule over what Human Rights Watch describes as one of the most repressive authoritarian states in the world? That's what we'll find out in this episode of The Infographic Show, what Kim Jong-un does in his daily life. Because North Korea is a closed society, information about Kim Jong-un's whereabouts is tightly controlled. What we know about his daily life is pieced together from North Korea's state-run media and from accounts of people who know him personally. 
Some aspects of his life are kept secret, but others have been widely publicized. As the supreme leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un must devote part of his day to running his country. Nearly every day, he makes official visits to places throughout North Korea, including factories, farms, and construction sites. Reports of these visits are posted online in a special supreme leader activity section of Rodong Sinmun, the state newspaper of North Korea. One reason for these visits is that they help to promote his political strategy of Byungjin, which a Vox article describes as developing both nuclear weapons and the economy equally. Some of the construction sites he visits are for what a CNBC article calls expanded tourism that would generate hard currency. Another article describes how a model collective farm with 400 families was benefiting from his economic reform of giving farmers control over what they could produce and sell as long as they could meet their state quotas first in Chinese-style reforms of the 1980s. Reliable information about the impact of his economic reforms is difficult to obtain, but economists estimate North Korea growth rates of between 1-2% to since Kim Jong-un came to power. Newsweek reports that another purpose of these visits is also to give the impression that Kim Jong-un is devoted to his people. Unfortunately, it is mainly a false impression. Most of the time, he lives separated from them, spending most of the country's wealth on the military, about 24% of North Korea's GDP, and creating a cushy life for himself and his elite inner social circle. In fact, 20% of the state's budget is spent just for his thoroughbred horses. While some North Koreans may dislike the way he runs the country, they remain silent out of fear. According to a 2013 Human Rights Watch report, North Korea operates a vast network of informants who monitor and report to the authorities fellow citizens they suspect of criminal or subversive behavior. And in 2018, Human Rights Watch reported that the government continued to generate fearful obedience from citizens by means of threatened and actual execution, detention, and forced labor under harsh, sometimes fatal conditions. Out of public view, he spends the day attending to other state business. He continues to manage his nuclear program, which is still up and running despite recent negotiations with the United States. A recently published Foreign Affairs article reported that he is not cheating on his agreement with the United States because he never promised to stop producing nuclear weapons or ballistic missiles. He also probably spends part of his day keeping track of his enemies and figuring out new, terrifying ways to deal with them. His his brutal treatment toward those who plot to overthrow him is well known. A New York Times article reports that in the first six years as leader, he has ordered the executions of at least 340 people. Some of these executions made headlines because they involved members of his own family, such as the execution of his uncle, Jang Song Faik, for treason in 2013. Bloomberg reports that last year, he had his half-brother Kim Jong-nam killed with a chemical weapon at an airport in Malaysia, a move that removed one of his last remaining rivals for power in the bloodline. While we don't know if Kim Jong-un orders executions every day, we can safely say that they are a regular part of his routine to maintain power. However, Kim Jong-un has a softer side too. Since 2009, he has been married to Ri Sol Ju. She is supposedly a former cheerleader and singer, but a Business Insider article reports that little is known about the life Ri led before marrying Kim. She is recognized for being stylish and has recently appeared more frequently by his side at public events as part of his image makeover to be seen as a normal leader. It is widely reported that the couple have three children, but not much is known about them. An odd source of insight into Kim Jong-un's family life is former NBA player Dennis Rodman, who has become Kim Jong-un's friend. The Sun reports he confirmed that the second of Kim Jong-un's children is a girl named Kim ju A. He also described Kim Jong-un as a good dad who has a good family. Would Rodman provide such a glowing review of the dictator as a family man if he knew about his extramarital sexcapades? A North Korean defector claims that Kim Jong-un has sex slaves. As a former member of his elite inner circle, she recalls seeing some of her attractive teenage classmates pulled out of school to work at one of his hundreds of homes in Pyongyang. She said they are trained not only to serve him food, but also to give him massages and sex as well. It's not easy to be a sex slave to a 290 pound dictator who could make you disappear if you do not please him. So the hazard pay for their service is that they have the opportunity to marry a high ranking official after Kim Jong-un discards them. While his wife is probably not happy about the sex slaves, Kim Jong-un and his family live in luxury. According to MSN, they have 17 palaces scattered throughout the state and even a 
private island. Newsweek reports that his main palace at Ryongsang covers 4.6 square miles and includes an Olympic-sized swimming pool, banquet facilities, a shooting range, and even a giant water slide. MSN also lists other expensive items he owns, including a 200-foot custom-designed yacht, a private jet called Air Force Un that is estimated to cost around $1.5 million, and a $1.7 million armored car for state visits. Perhaps the biggest part of his daily routine is drinking and eating. MSN reports that he spends an average of $30 million each year on imported liquor. Among his drinks of choice are whiskey, cognac, and snake wine, an aphrodisiac which comes with a dead cobra in the bottle, according to one source. A former chef for the Kim family claims that Kim Jong-un could drink two entire bottles of Cristal champagne in one sitting. MSN also estimates that he spends millions of dollars on fancy imported food, including top quality pork from Denmark, caviar from Iran, and Kobe beef. One of his favorite foods is a mental cheese, which a Sun article states he developed a taste for at a boarding school in Switzerland as a young boy. Kim Jong-un is also a heavy smoker. He can frequently be seen at public appearances with a cigarette in his mouth. And no cheap drugstore brands will do for him. He smokes Yves Saint Laurent cigarettes, which cost $44 per pack, according to MSN. For those of you who feel outraged that obese Kim Jong-un lives high on the hog while 40% of his people are malnourished, you might find comfort in knowing that he does not always enjoy his luxurious existence. He lives in constant fear of being overthrown by others, and this fear has caused him to suffer sleep deprivation according to one source. Despite being a young man, he is already paying for his overindulgence in lard, liquor, and ladies. According to a Fox News article, experts speculate that he suffers from various serious health problems, including gout, diabetes, high blood pressure, a sexually transmitted disease, and psychological issues. If an assassin's bullet does not do him in, his lavish life of excess probably will. Cast your mind back a few months and you'll remember that the internet was awash with rumors that North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un had finally died. It took weeks for any official confirmation that he was alive to surface, and Kim Jong-un's three-week absence was rife with reports that his younger sister, Kim Yo-jong, might take his place as North Korea's supreme leader. Kim Jong-un has been a famously brutal ruler in a country with a history of eccentric dictators. So the real question is whether his sister would change things for the better, continue business as usual, or begin her own horrific reign that make her brother and father look like Gandhi in comparison. You might be surprised by the answer. Back in April, Yo Jong was the talk of the international stage as all eyes moved to North Korea and its possible shift in power. She'd also been spotted at political summits and even sitting next to US Vice President Mike Pence at the South Korean Olympics. The Hermit Kingdom is famously reserved with the information it releases to outsiders, with goofy tidbits like Kim Jong Il's allegedly perfect bowling game and Kim Jong Un's alleged ability to drive a car at age three being largely unintentional exports. Nobody really knew what to think of the mysterious Kim Yo Jong. Some, bizarrely, congratulated her for the possibility of breaking the glass ceiling of North Korea's supreme leadership. Twitter was flooded with jokes and memes complimenting Yo Jong's physical appearance or imagining potential interactions between her and US President Donald Trump. Others were less optimistic and worried that the shards of Yo Jong's glass ceiling would rain down on North Korean people below to deadly results. There's been long-running speculation among foreign policy experts that Kim Yo-jong is the brains of the Kim Jong-un dictatorship. But like any true Machiavellian manipulator, she prefers to remain in the shadows while her boisterous brother acts as the face of the regime. Seeing as she's shrouded in secrecy and is unlikely to give any interviews or release a tell-all memoir anytime soon, the best indication we have for Yo-jong's character as a potential ruler is her time serving her brother's brutal regime. Kim Jong-un has been in power in North Korea for nine years, assuming the role of the country's supreme leader following the death of his father, Kim Jong-il. Under his rule as dictator, citizens of the DPRK have a number of their rights severely restricted. For example, the media and access to the internet are controlled and limited by Kim's regime. Anyone found to be openly critical of the regime is arrested and can expect a long stay in one of the country's many forced labor camps, reserved not only for political prisoners but their families too. Unless you toe the party line in all things, you can kiss your freedom and probably your life goodbye. Information coming out of North Korea, even details regarding the personal lives of Kim Jong-un's family, are often altered and falsified. 
so it's hard to sum up everything we know about Kim Yo-jong with 100% accuracy. What we do know, however, is that she was born in either 1987 or 89 depending on the report. She's the youngest of Kim Jong-il's children, lived a relatively sheltered childhood, and has a degree in computer science from Kim Il-sung University. Though prior to this, she was schooled in Switzerland with her brother. According to a number of reports, she maintains a very close relationship with Jong-un. Maybe they even plot ways to murder and torture their citizens together. While her father held the title of Supreme Leader, Kim Yo-jong served as one of a group of his advisors from 2009, earning nicknames like the Ivanka Trump of North Korea. But Kim Yo-jong really only had her presence noticed after she participated in the third conference of the Workers' Party of Korea, or WPK, in 2010, and then attended her father's funeral in the following year, alongside her brother. So, what position does Kim Yo-jong currently hold within the WPK? Well, since 2014, she's been the first deputy director of the party's propaganda and agitation department. As the name suggests, this is the department in charge of distributing propaganda to the people in North Korea. Remember earlier when we mentioned that Kim Jong-un's regime controls the country's media? Well, that's thanks in part to the work the propaganda and agitation department does under the leadership of his sister, who currently runs the PAD as the de facto leader. But how exactly do they control the media? Well, say you were a North Korean print journalist, writing for a national newspaper. Every newspaper printed in North Korea goes through three rounds of censorship. First, the paper's editor will have to go through and remove anything that could potentially be read as speaking out against the WPK or Kim Jong-un. And then the PAD carries out two additional checks for any anti-WPK material. And you'd better hope they don't find anything in there that could land you and your family in a labor camp as well as filtering out any information that the WPK doesn't want the North Korean public to know. The PAD is also in charge of translating works from other countries and keeping these secret and censored from the public. They also create all the guidelines for the propaganda distributed in North Korea, so you can have comfort of knowing that any posters, artwork, or music praising the WPK has been approved by Kim Yo-jong herself. Her high-ranking role in the propaganda and agitation department isn't the only feather in Kim Yo-jong's cap, however. In October of 2017, Kim Yo-jong became the second woman ever to be appointed to the Politburo. What's the Politburo? Its full title is the Political Bureau of the Central Committee of the Workers' Party of Korea, and it is the highest authority in decision-making in the entirety of North Korea, as well as a real mouthful to say out loud. Comprising important state and military leaders, the Politburo is in charge of overseeing the day-to-day -day running of the WPK. It's Kim Jong-un's inner sanctum, his Jedi Council, his most trusted politicians and generals elected by the Central Committee. They're not only the highest authority within the WPK, but also have absolute ruling power over the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, and their decisions become automatically enforced by law. In 2017, it was speculated that Yo Jung's appointment to the Politburo was an indication that her brother wanted her to replace the first woman to previously hold the position within the bureau, that being their aunt, Kim Kyung Hwa. While their aunt and Kim Yo Jung were rumored to have a good relationship, it's been hinted that Kim Kyung Hwa wasn't playing an active role in the WPK's regime. And this is likely a reason why Kim Jong-un might have wanted his sister to replace her. Yo Jong, after all, had made a reputation for herself as someone he could trust to act with the regime's best interests in mind, given her role with the propaganda and agitation department. However, like many official appointments within North Korea, Kim's involvement in the Politburo was not exempt from a state of perpetual fluctuation within the ranks of the WPK. In April of 2019, Kim Yo Jong was removed from the Politburo only to be reinstalled a year later in April 2020, around the same time that rumors of Kim Jong Un's death began circulating online. From this, it's easy to infer that Yo Jong knows her way around the art of political maneuvering and is actively pursuing power in the event of her brother's untimely death. In spite of this, there appears to be a real bond of trust between Yo Jong and her brother, making it seem like the shrewd and manipulative Cersei Lannister to his violent and unpredictable Joffrey. Given the numerous high-profile and high-power positions Kim Jong-un has bestowed upon her, it's a safe assumption that he trusts her and her dedication to the regime of the Workers' Party of Korea. That certainly ranks her higher in Kim Jong-un's treatment than their other siblings, especially their eldest brother Kim Jong-nam. After being prevented from becoming his father's successor in favor of Kim Jong-un, Kim Jong-nam was then assassinated in Malaysia in 2017. He had been openly critical of his brother's regime, and that earned him an assassination by his own brother. But you'd never believe how it played out. While Kim Jong-nam was waiting to catch a flight in Kuala Lumpur International Airport, two women approached him claiming to be filming a prank TV show. 
They sprayed him in the face with a deadly nerve agent, and in minutes, Nam was dead. It was never entirely clear if the women were groomed assassins or unwitting pawns who had no idea what they were actually doing. Given Kim Jong-un's penchant for having his siblings assassinated, Kim Yo-jong has done well to not only serve her brother's regime, but also garner enough of his trust to be granted multiple positions of power within the WPK, allowing her to work her way up the party's ranks despite North Korea having an extremely masculine and chauvinist culture. It's clear that she doesn't share the anti-regime sentiments of her brother Kim Jong-nam, and that seems to have served her well and put her in the supreme leader's favor, with her growing influence within the North Korean government leading many to believe that that she'll one day succeed him. Of course, many definitely doesn't mean everyone. A North Korea specialist named Leonid Petrov claimed that Kim Yo-jong couldn't possibly replace her brother as the country's primary decision maker. He told The Guardian that North Korea is a Confucian country where seniority and masculinity are respected. She is Kim's most trusted ally, but no more than that. On the other side of the argument, there are those who believe Kim Yo-jong is certain to succeed her brother to the position of supreme leader. Washington Post journalist Anna Fifield claimed that Kim Yo-jong is the only Kim family member who could even possibly take over the reins from Kim Jong-un in a tweet made around the time rumors of the supreme leader's death were widespread. There is some merit to this, as the only other sibling among Kim Jong-il's infamous progeny is Kim Jong-chul who, according to most reports, has no interest on ruling the country and prefers to instead devote his time to learning guitar and obsessing over Eric Clapton. Yeah, you thought your family was weird. Given how quickly Kim Yo-jong has climbed the WPK's ranks, taking on more responsibility and control within the party, spreading her influence and her public profile in recent years, it seems entirely plausible that she could succeed her brother in the event of his death. How she would rule over North Korea is something on which we could only speculate. Currently, it's hard to imagine anything worse than life under the oppressive regime of Kim Jong-un and the WPK. And seeing as she's proved herself a dedicated enough member of the party to join the Politburo, it seems highly likely that Kim Yo-jong would at least continue to rule North Korea in her brother's image. It's May 1951 and the Korean War has been raging for a year. The world is still weary from the ravages of World War II, and the United States is the only nation capable of leading a UN response to the attempts by the Communist North to seize South Korea and unify the peninsula by force. The conflict has set the stage for a defining age in human history, the Cold War, and soon a regiment of American soldiers will find that curious visitors from another world may also be interested in how this war plays out. The Americans are 60 miles north of Seoul. The jungle is thick and oppressively hot. The North Koreans have been pushed back from South Korea in a brilliant pincer movement carried out by U.S. forces. Rather than risk being destroyed completely, North Korea forces quickly retreated into the north as U.S.-led NATO troops attempted to encircle them with an amphibious landing in the north. Despite these military successes, though, the troops are nervous. At every sunrise, every man on the front lines has one question on their lips. Have the Soviets joined the war? Have we finally started World War III? Private First Class Francis P. Wall and his platoon are providing security for an attachment of artillery, which is itself preparing to rain down fire on a village full of North Korean forces. Men watch the jungle around them cautiously, despite being a few miles from the official front. Raiding parties against the American artillery are not uncommon. The artillery is set to fire just before dawn, and the villagers below have all been warned of the impending attack and told to flee. As the hour approaches, the big guns begin opening up. Artillery shells whiz through the air, bursting just above the village and showering the North Korean troops below with deadly shrapnel. The thunderous booms echo across the hills as a dozen guns open up one by one and deliver death to the enemy. Suddenly, though, Private Wall and other men responsible for providing security for the artillery see something in the hills above the village. It seems that the bombardment has attracted the attention of something none of the men will ever be able to explain. The light is dim at first but quickly grows in brightness as it moves down the jungle hill. To the Americans, it appears like a floating jack-o'-lantern emitting some kind of light from its body that is at first orange in color. To their shock, the light moves just over the village even as the American artillery continues to pour fire into it. The air-bursting shells detonate all around it, and then the light does something incredible. In a move that defies all known physics, the light is able to rapidly move to the side of an exploding shell, avoiding being directly hit by the rounds. Even avoiding a direct hit, the object, which by now the men know must be some sort of craft, must have some sort of protective shielding, as it's still being showered by frag from the exploding artillery shells. Even if it is receiving any damage, though, 
The Americans on the ground are unable to tell, and simply watch in awe for almost an hour as the craft weathers the bombardment of the village. Then, the craft turns its sights on the Americans. With no warning, the craft turns in place and now moves directly toward the American position. The men are nervous, nothing in their training has prepared them for this. Is it a secret Soviet craft, perhaps based on stolen Nazi technology? The speculation runs wild as the men prepare for what might be an attack on their position. Private Wall asks his company commander for permission to fire on the object as it approaches, using his M1 rifle loaded with armor-piercing rounds. His company commander agrees, and as the object approaches still bathed in orange light, Wall and his squad mates open up. Their fire is accurate and the craft comes under fire from several rifles. If the craft was employing some sort of protective shielding against the artillery shrapnel blast, it must have dropped it because the men are able to clearly hear the metallic sides of the craft ringing out from the sounds of their bullets striking it. As the men fire, a few of the armor-piercing rounds must have found their mark, piercing the strange craft. Suddenly, the craft goes wild. The lights begin flickering on and off erratically, and the craft makes crazy sporadic movements from side to side. At one point, though, the craft remains floating in the air above the GIs. The lights go completely off, but then seems to flicker back to life. The Americans on the ground worry that the craft is going to either explode or come crashing down on their heads. Then, the craft seems to regain its stability, and suddenly the mountain valley is filled with the unbearable sound of what seem to be dozens of diesel train locomotives starting up all at once. The craft begins pulsing bluish light and attacks the soldiers below. As the men watch helplessly, the craft sweeps a ray across the battlefield below it. The brightly colored ray seems to come in pulses that the men can only see when it sweeps directly over them. Like car headlights or a searchlight in the dark, the craft sweeps this ray across the ground below it, seeking out soldiers where they lay in their fighting positions. As it sweeps over each man, they're racked with a burning, tingling sensation all over their flesh. The company commander immediately shouts for his men to take shelter from their bunkers. Small dugouts reinforced with plywood and sandbags. The bunkers offer protection for their men from the artillery bombardments, and the soldiers dive below the ground to take shelter from the mysterious ray. From inside these bunkers, the soldiers are able to watch the craft through small peepholes. Some of them even start returning fire from small firing slits. The craft suddenly blasts the entire area with a bright light, turning night into day briefly. Perhaps frustrated by the men safely out of its grasp in their bunkers, the craft then pulses with light once more and without warning shoots off at a 45 degree angle. To the astonishment of Private Wall, the craft seems to fly off at impossible speed, quickly being lost to the starry night sky. Lingering in their bunkers, it's a few minutes before the men work up the courage to leave the safety they offer. The company commander quickly calls for a meeting, and to a man, the soldiers all agree on one thing. They aren't telling a soul about what they just experienced. While each day the company is expected to file a report on its activities for the day, the company commander agrees it's best to leave this one off the books for now, for fear that they'll all be thought of as crazy. At the time, there's no such thing as UFOs in the public consciousness, and while mysterious stories of World War II Foo Fighters circulate through the military, nobody has yet made the link between their appearances and otherworldly alien visitors. Better then to keep everyone's mouth shut so they don't end up locked up in the loony bin. However, a few days later, the men of the 25th Infantry Division, 27th Regiment, 2nd Battalion, Easy Company, start to fall ill. They're nauseous, they have terrible headaches and diarrhea. So many of them are affected at once that the army has to cut a road through the jungle to send ambulances and evacuate many of them. When doctors examine them, they find the men have extremely high counts of white blood cells and seem to be suffering from dysentery. After the war, Private Wall would struggle with PTSD and drop from 180 pounds to 136. The weight loss would be permanent, and the Private would struggle all his life with weight issues as he struggled to recover to his normal weight. An official explanation for the event was never given, and with no official report filed, an investigation was never conducted. Whatever the men saw that night in Korea, though, was not a one-time incident, as GIs all across the conflict would tell very similar stories. For years, the mysterious craft are thought to possibly be Soviet secret weapons, but when those weapons never materialized in Soviet arsenals, the men involved would be forced to look for more otherworldly explanations. As the Cold War came to an end, it was revealed that on the other side of the Iron Curtain, the Soviets were also encountering strange alien craft. 
Some even allege that the Soviet military had been involved in a conflict with underwater alien beings. According to allegedly secret documents leaked by former Soviet intelligence officials turned whistleblowers, military divers encountered a strange being in a silvery diving suit with a bubble-like helmet. When they returned to the area later to try and capture it with a net, the divers were forcibly sent upwards toward the surface by an invisible force. Their quick ascension from 50 meters down gave many of the men the bends. However, others argue that UFO sightings in wartime in Korea or even during the Cold War were nothing more than simply the effects of severe stress on the human brain. With both sides acutely aware that a full-scale global war could erupt at any time, plus with the stress of normal combat, the mind may play tricks on some people, even creating outright hallucinations. Plus, as some have pointed out, the symptoms that Private Well described are similar to regular dysentery. Whatever the truth is, wartime UFO sightings are nothing new, and the Korean War is seen by many as the floodgate opening up to what would become a full-blown alien incursion of planet Earth. Perhaps this isn't as surprising as it might seem, though. After all, this was just years after the United States developed a working nuclear weapon, propelling humanity into the atomic age. And shortly after, the world found itself in the grip of a potentially civilization-destroying Cold War. Could aliens have been interested in how this part of human history played out? If reports from Korea are true, the answer may be a very frightful yes. Kim Jong-un, madman ruler of North Korea, evil dictator, and, well, a rather portly man who stands in stark contrast to a malnourished population. Despite a major economic upturn in the hermit kingdom, the sad truth is that most of the meager economic benefit has not gone to the majority of the population, but rather to those such as the elite few allowed to live in Pyongyang and the senior ruling party leadership. Though exact figures are impossible to ascertain due to the secretive nature of the country, North Korean defectors claim that malnourishment and at times outright starvation are still common throughout the nation. On top of this, the CIA confirms that the nation is unable to grow enough food domestically to feed itself. So just how is Kim Jong-un so rotund while the rest of the nation starves? As mentioned, the CIA publicly states that North Korea is unable to grow enough food domestically to feed all of its people. While normally this isn't great news for a country, it's almost never catastrophic. Plenty of nations around the world don't grow enough of certain crops to feed their own people's demand for those items. Those shortfalls are made up with international trade. For example, the US produces far more wheat than it consumes, and it is in fact the world's largest exporter of wheat, making up over 15% of global wheat exports which it sends to nations lacking this crop. Unfortunately for North Korea, however, international sanctions against the nation have stopped the import of many foodstuffs, leaving the nation mostly to fend for itself. During the Cold War, North Korea was in effect a client state of the Soviet Union and heavily relied on Soviet imports to feed its people. However, after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, food and fuel imports were stopped. And worst luck of all, just before a major natural famine struck the nation, Estimates range from between several hundred thousand dead to as many as three million, and North Korea quickly began looking for new support. Yet with international condemnation against North Korea over its nuclear ambitions, the abducting of South Korean and Japanese citizens, and general bad behavior, there weren't many nations willing to take the tiny murderous kingdom under its wing. That's until China's ambitions to push the US out of the Pacific led it to nurture a deepening relationship with the Hermit Kingdom a long-time thorn in the US's side. For China supporting North Korea and propping it up with food and materials exports was a win-win. It prevented the nation from descending into chaos, which would prompt a massive refugee crisis across its own border. And it made sure this stubborn thorn would stay permanently lodged in the US's side. Yet even China and its international ambitions have their limits, and after North Korea's successful nuclear tests, not even the Chinese would withstand the international backlash against their pet state and so they too began to cut off trade with North Korea. The effects were devastating and sadly, just like UN sanctions, impacted most of the poorer populations living outside of the gilded city centers. Kim Jong-un dug his heels in, however, and turned to that age-old North Korean pseudo-religion of Juche to encourage his people. Juche is a philosophy of self-reliance enacted by Kim Jong-un's grandfather Kim Il-sung, an international villain from its inception. North Korea had faced sanctions and trade restrictions from the start. While Soviet aid poured into the country every year, Kim Il-sung was determined that the nation would stand on its own two feet. Thus, Juche was born. A philosophy of necessity, Juche instructed the people to bear the hardships they suffered and to always work to help North Korea be self-reliant. The nation should not depend on any outside aid for help. 
and should produce all its own fuel, food, and materials needed for modern life completely on its own. Sadly, this proved to be unrealistic, yet Juche continued to thrive and in fact helped ensure the Kims would stay in power. Thanks to Juche, mass starvations and hardships were not the fault of poor leadership, but rather an indirect attack by a hostile world. By appealing to nationalistic fervor, Juche helped the Kims hold on to the reins of power. Yet North Korea was never truly as broke as it would appear to be. In the 1970s, Kim Il-sung created a secret government organization that would come to be known as Office 39. By setting up a string of companies around the world, Office 39's goal was to bring in hard currency to the nation. But instead of going to meeting the needs of the people, it would all go straight to the dear leader. This secretive organization continues to operate around the world, bypassing international sanctions against North Korean businesses, by posing as other nationalities, and engaging in both legal and illegal trade. Today it's estimated that Office 39 brings in up to 2 billion US dollars a year. To make money for Dear Leader's personal spending habits, Office 39 engaged in things such as selling ginsengs, gemstones, and gold internationally. To bypass sanctions, the operatives would smuggle goods from North Korea into China and then pose as Chinese. According to one defector who worked in the organization for five years, it was easy to smuggle goods into China because their border is wide open and the Chinese have generally only cared about North Korean refugees. While no direct evidence has ever linked the Chinese to Office 39 activities, it's well known that the Chinese have for a long time turned a blind eye to their puppet state's illegal activities. And there are deep suspicions about how up to $2 billion in illicit international trade could be orchestrated by the North Koreans inside Chinese territory without the Chinese knowing about it. In all likelihood, China not only knows but facilitates the act, taking a cut of the profits for itself, a form of tax on Kim Jong-un's slush fund which the dear leader is obligated to pay. Office 39 also engages heavily in counterfeiting narcotics and arms sales. North Korea's forgery of US $100 bills were the most accurate fakes in the world and came to be known as super notes. The massive forgery forced the US to immediately issue a new $100 bill with improved security features. Office 39 also engages in the sale of narcotics such as amphetamines and opioids, which are produced domestically and shipped all around the world even to the US. To round out the drug trade, Office 39 also ships weapons to buyers around the world, including the sale of items banned by international law, such as ballistic missiles. In 2013, a ship was detained in the Panama Canal when it was discovered to be smuggling weapons and parts of ballistic missiles. And while its Chinese owners feigned ignorance, it's widely believed that they were simply yet another front for Office 39. Office 39 is estimated to account for 30 to 40 percent of the total North Korean economy. And it's not content with simply exploring both illegal and legal goods. As the world has wised up to Office 39 schemes, it's become harder for them to generate money, which has led to the organization now turning its eyes inward. It's reported that Office 39 has seized on every profitable sector of the North Korean economy, everything from marine produce to mining to textiles, and has monopolized it, sending a sizable portion of the profits to the dear leader. In exchange, this money goes to fund Kim Jong-un's nuclear program and helps ensure that he remains in power by the time-honored and thoroughly corrupt tradition of North Korea's gift politics, a practice which ensures that the current dear leader stays in good graces of potential political adversaries and enemies. Gift politics involves the giving of lavish gifts by the dear leader to subordinates, funded by the government itself. In essence, the Kims have for years been buying the loyalty of the politically powerful around them, with funds meant to see the needs of the North Korean population. With the world's largest collection of liquor and lavish decadent parties and ceremonies, it's no surprise Kim Jong-un is still packing away the pounds even as his people suffer and starve. North Korea has for decades suffered under the most grievous levels of internal corruption imaginable, with each subsequent dear leader lining their own pockets while the people starve. There's an eerie silence in the stadium as a 17-year-old boy is pushed onto the playing field in a squeaky wheelchair. His mother, among a crowd of about 10,000 people, is holding back tears. With his mouth gagged, he wriggles around in the chair, just as three soldiers point their machine guns at him. Nine shots are fired. His chest explodes. There's a collective gasp in the crowd, then silence, followed by frantic, rapturous clapping that lasts 10 whole minutes. Can you imagine being in that crowd, being the parent of the victim, a spectator expected to clap? Sounds crazy, but this is life in North Korea. So. What had this young man done to deserve nine bullets in the chest? The answer is K-pop. Yeah, South Korean pop music. We know it's criminally bad, but come on, being a fan shouldn't warrant an execution. 
The supreme leader, Kim Jong-un, doesn't like K-pop. He hates it, in fact. He says it's evil. He also believes that South Korean soap operas and American pop music corrupt North Korea's youths. And he hates foreign pop music and foreign dramas because they show North Koreans a reality they're not allowed to see. In 2021, it was reported that Kim Jong-un had lost the plot where this was concerned. That year, he pushed into law new rules about what content people could and could not watch. Pretty much meant they were allowed to watch North Korean propaganda and nothing else. It meant that dancing to the music of Girls' Generation or watching an episode of The World of the Married could get you killed. We aren't exaggerating. Some teenagers were recently executed for just watching Squid Game. It was revealed by activists that foreign content had been coming into North Korea via the town of Haisan, which is an important trading hub with China. The problem with this proximity is tons of illegal content was getting across the border, as were such things as mobile phones. North Korean security services got busy hunting this content down. When they found it, often on teenagers, the kids were sometimes executed, sometimes in front of their classmates, sometimes in front of their parents in stadiums, as you just heard. So, crazy law number one, death for listening to pop music and watching silly dramas. The regime calls them anti-socialist and non-socialist. They're really strict about it these days. A North Korean NGO said in 2019 that it had discovered 318 execution sites in North Korea. People were shot down in public schools, stadiums, markets, and rice fields, with the crime being anything from watching a foreign soap opera to stealing someone's cow. But a defector said that when he was in a prison camp in the 2000s, he and about 80 other inmates were forced to watch three women being executed. They'd been charged with having ideas about running off to China. So one law in North Korea could be said to be the first rule about North Korea is you do not talk about North Korea. Not to anyone else, anyway. We explain later what happens if you have the audacity to make an international phone call. The executions are almost always by firing squad, although there has been the odd hanging now and again. Usually the victims are lined up. Three soldiers do the shooting, firing off three rounds. One defector said he'd seen it happen. He noted that the soldiers were upset about it. He said they were drunk. Maybe they can only go through with it after some booze. As you know, the regime hates the outside world, or rather they fear the outside world. That means anything associated with the outside is treated like a virus virus that could spread easily within their perfect society. This is why schoolgirls have been sent to do hard time in mines in the countryside just because they tried to sound like South Koreans when they sang. Kim Jong-un has said that anyone mimicking South Korean accents can expect to be packed off to those mines where they might never return. Same goes for haircuts. Under no circumstances should North Koreans try and copy the hairstyles of the West or the rest of Asia. You might not have noticed it when watching videos, but everyone seems to have the exact same haircut. Boys, girls, women and men. You can see photos of good-looking women walking down the street, perhaps chatting on their local call-only mobile phones, and it seems as though they've all been reading the same fashion magazine. It's got nothing to do with personal choice. They have to look that way because if one of them decides to branch out and look like Ariana Grande, they might end up in the mines. Same goes for the men. That regime has approved just 28 hairstyles, but none of them are what you might call risque. Men are told they should keep their hair short, but never totally shaved. If it gets longer than 5 centimeters, almost 2 inches, it's time for a cut. Flat tops, a North Korean favorite, are recommended. Women can grow their hair into a bob, but not very long. And no way can they have it really short. That would look too manly, too rebellious. There was actually a TV show in North Korea called Let's Trim Our Hair in Accordance with the Socialist Lifestyle. The show told the folks why they should follow hairstyle rules. Goes without saying that they don't want people to have any sort of individuality. As the saying goes, if a nail sticks out, hammer it down. It's actually a Japanese expression and not too important now in that country, but in North Korea it influences every part of society. Spiky hair, green hair, or messy hair does not adhere to socialist values, said the TV show. In one episode in 2005, a guy was dragged off the streets. His hair was all over the place. The TV presenter said to the people watching, We cannot help questioning the cultural taste of this comrade, who is incapable of feeling ashamed of his hairstyle. Can we expect a man with this disheveled mindset to perform his duty well? There was only one answer, of course. Still, an unsocialist hairdo won't get someone hard labor. Instead, when CCTV found such people with their itinerant hair, they were publicly shamed. They were reported at work and were ostracized by their colleagues. The viewers heard some scientific facts, too, North Korean style. The presenter said long hair affects human intelligence development because it consumes a great deal of nutrition. If you have no access to decent books or the internet, how would you ever be able to refute that? It's the same with clothes. People won't get the machine gun treatment for wearing the wrong kind of clothes, but they will be accused of having a bad ideological and mental state. Once that gets back to their boss, they'll be snubbed by their colleagues. The newspapers might make a meal of it, bringing on more shame. 
a regime newspaper called Nodong Sinmun wrote that people's clothes show their cultural standards and mental and moral state. It explained no matter how good the clothes, if one does not wear tidy shoes, one's personality will be downgraded. We should say that there's a big difference between being a bit untidy to showing everyone you are totally into a Western or South Korean style. One could be blamed on laziness or unkemptness, but Western fashion following is sedition. One is harmless, the other is exceedingly dangerous. Human Rights Watch wrote in 2021 that a North Korean might be executed or sent to a prison camp, Kaewaso, for 15 years just for watching one episode of a South Korean soap opera. It also said that the new rules dictated that merely uttering a few words of South Korean even just to practice can result in two years of hard labor. There are reports of kids texting each other and using some words of South Korean slang. The sentence for that was three months of hard labor. In a letter to the 10th Congress of Youth League in 2021, Kim Jong-un explained why he was coming down on people so hard. It was a long letter, so we'll just show you a few snippets translated into English. It starts off positively, saying, The faithful millions of young people have always been a fortress for our party, which is leading the revolution to a great leap, braving the worst ever challenges. These kids, he said, should be at war against the capitalists. He said they should dress smart, speak well, and learn revolutionary songs. He said some do that, but others have been transformed by the malignant tumors of an anti-socialist idea coming from foreign lands. He was executing folks for listening to K-pop because they were bringing in dangerous poisons of outside influence. As we showed you in the intro, when the leader makes a speech like that, you're expected to clap like crazy, and we mean clap until your hands hurt. People have been executed in the past for not clapping enough, for looking like they didn't care about the immortal speaker on the podium. This is nothing new. It happened in the Soviet Union under Stalin. But you can imagine what would happen if you fell asleep when the leader was speaking, just as happens all the time in the West. Napping in British Parliament is the norm. There's no official law for this in North Korea, but they can easily accuse someone of being seditious or at least unpatriotic. It happened to the former defense minister, Hyun Yong Cho, who was usually a top-notch clapper. The state gunned him down in 2015. Some people said the reason was he was caught napping while Kim Jong-un was speaking, but the real reason was likely that he'd just gotten on the wrong side of the leader. No official reason was given in the end, but Kim must have really hated him because this time, the firing squad used an anti-aircraft gun. It happened in front of hundreds of people at Pyongyang's Kangkong military shooting range. So that's another rule, or at least an unwritten rule, clap when you have to. And don't be the first to stop. When the big man is talking, don't you dare think you can catch 50 winks. This is serious. Hundreds of officials in the past have been executed when it was thought that they were becoming slightly rebellious by not paying attention when they should. This next bit of information sounds so crazy, you'd think it was Western propaganda. You already know you have to respect the supreme leader at all costs. In 2020, it seemed a woman living in Onsong County near China let that respect lapse for a few minutes when her house caught fire and her kids were stuck inside. As the flames tickled the sky, she rushed into the house to collect her screaming kids. She should have been celebrated for her bravery, but she was arrested. Guess why? The reason is, like in every North Korean household, there were portraits on the wall of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il. Their rotund faces lit on fire as the woman concentrated on making sure her kids got to see puberty. The news somehow got back to the Ministry of State Security, likely through a snitching neighbor. The case was investigated and it was said that a political crime might have occurred because she rescued her children and not the portraits. What's even more ridiculous is a farmer had rushed in to save the portraits and while the woman was condemned in the media, he was hailed as a national hero. What's even more annoying is that the woman was jailed during the investigation, which meant that she couldn't tend to her hospitalized kids, who both had serious burns. The Daily NK, a South Korean newspaper writing about everything North Korea, said that some neighbors wanted to help the mother buy the antibiotics her kids needed, but they were too scared as they thought they might be charged with political crimes. A source told the paper the mother will be able to focus on caring for her children once the authorities end their investigation. The supreme leader is kind of a divinity, which is why myths abound, such as the ground cracking apart and lightning striking when the last leader popped his clogs. It's said that he once hit 38 under par in 18 holes, the first time he ever played golf. The official state document said on the 7700-yard championship course at Pyongyang, he hit a 
11 holes in one that day. Not too bad for 52-year-old and 5'3 in height on a course that most professionals would struggle to make par. Only a god could perform such a miraculous feat of sporting triumph. This is why in North Korea, if you mention the word Jesus or Buddha, you're in for one hell of a bad time. The country is not big enough for two gods. Only the Kims perform miracles. Gods have nothing on them. In 2014, an American named Jeffrey Fowle made the mistake of his life when he thought it was a good idea to visit North Korea while embracing the Christian tradition of spreading the word of God. This was about as prudent as taking a bath while holding a plugged-in TV. It's one thing keeping your God theories to yourself in North Korea, but this guy went into a restaurant called the Chongjin Sailors Club, and on purpose he left a Bible in the restroom hoping someone would pick it up and later choose Jesus as their savior. Fowl was arrested and imprisoned. He appeared on TV later telling the folks back home he'd been treated well. They always say that. You'll know why, soon. After five months, the North Koreans sent him back home, but with a warning. Keep your god in the USA. We don't want him here. He's persona non grata. Had Fowl not been used as a diplomatic bargaining chip, he'd likely have been executed or at least spent a few years doing hard labor. Around that same time, the American-Korean Kenneth Bay, an evangelical preacher, was sentenced to 15 years hard labor also for spreading the good word. He surprised everyone when he told the West that his prison camp wasn't actually that bad. In an interview from North Korea, he said, Yes, people here are very considerate, but my health is not in the best condition, so there are some difficulties. But everyone here is considerate and generous. We have doctors here, so I'm getting regular checkups. Still in 2015, North Korea executed six North Korean people who'd been spreading the word of God. In 2011, a man named Kwang Yun Som and her granddaughter were blasted away by a firing squad in Osong County. Their crime was loving the Christian God and telling others how great he was. You can't even practice superstitious stuff in North Korea. Shamans have been executed, as have fortune tellers. Lots and lots of fortune tellers. You can give 20 bucks to the same people in the US and they'll tell you one day you'll meet an important person named Gary, or was it Graham? Uh, it begins with G anyway. Perhaps that's exploitation, but it's hardly a crime. In 2017, it was reported that a 20-something-year-old North Korean woman had been telling folks about their life down the line, and she was later executed by firing squad in Chongjin. A news report at the time talked about how other fortune tellers had been arrested. It said one fortune teller, known as Hui Song, was sentenced to 18 years hard labor in Onsong. While in Horyong, six fortune tellers remain under investigation by local police with rumors that they may also face execution. In 2019, the news said two young fortune tellers were executed by firing squad in front of tens of thousands of people, factory workers, students, and office workers, at a location in Hamyong's Chongjin City. Another person got life in prison labor camps because they'd been accused of superstitious activities. In another case, the condemned fortune teller had used a three-year-old and a five-year-old, saying they were possessed and so they could see into the future. The media reported that people were starving and desperate, so they looked to anyone who could help, even a scammer who allegedly talked to ghosts. Each one of the fortune tellers was accused of anti-socialist behavior, which affected the preservation of social order. Now you might wonder what happens if North Koreans get on the phone with South Koreans and are told that their lives are actually terrible and that they live in a place of sheer madness where their brains are washed as often as their hands. If that happens and the person is caught, they'll likely die. Many North Koreans have been executed for the crime of talking on the phone to someone outside the country. As we explained in another show, North Korea runs a tight ship where the truth is concerned. Just one phone call to someone outside will likely get you executed, regardless of what's said. Remember the first rule of North Korea Club. In 2007, a South Pyongan province factory chief was executed for this crime in front of 150,000 people at a local stadium. The giant lid on North Korea's can of worms was to remain closed. It does, for the most part, which is why most people go along with stories of their leaders attaining golf scores that would make Tiger Woods envious. But just a quick phone call to the South can undo such ridiculous lies. Another thing you're not supposed to do in North Korea is look at pornographic material. North Koreans might be living in a never world, but their brains work the same as everyone else where sex is concerned. Like many of you guys and gals, they're suckers for images and videos of naked bodies getting down with a bit of coitus. It's said that while North Koreans might not have access to porn websites and hustler-type magazines, people still share illegal videos of women dancing while wearing not so many clothes. The possession, distribution, and production of this kind of thing can lead to many years in prison, and even death. News stories in 2021 told us about how a teenage boy caught watching porn got in big trouble. The stories don't explain how he was caught, but it's said when his parents were away at the house in North Pyongan province, the kid put on a video and indulged in the age-old tradition of the five 
five knuckle shuffle. This was said to be anti socialist behavior. Truth is, it tore at the threads of North Korea's tapestry of lies. Foreign porn exposes a different life, even if it's just as terrible actors picking up horny svelte hitchhikers. As per Article 29 of the law, the 15 year old kid was sent to a labor camp. His parents and even his high school principal were also sent to the labor camp. More and more pornographic videos or smutty content on USBs have been making their way across the border from China of late. Kim Jong-un says this is a threat to society and has cracked down on such behavior. Even worse, some folks have had the gall to make porn in North Korea. Defector smuggled one video titled The Secret Story of the Republic out of North Korea not so long ago. Although the film isn't available online, we tried to find it, for research purposes, of course. Kids have apparently been getting their hands on sexy CDs and renting them out in school, with reports saying such CDs were going for about 80 bucks in the past. That's a lot in North Korea. More recently, people have smuggled content on Chinese phones, and with those, they can watch homegrown Chinese stuff online. The North Korean regime, as much as they hate it, seems to understand how natural it is, so usually if someone's caught with just North Korean smut, they might get two to five years in the labor camps. The problem is when the porn is foreign, which means opening up that can of worms. As you know, people get executed for watching South Korean dramas, so American or Japanese hardcore has a big no-no. As Article 194 of the Conduct of Decadent Acts says, a person who watches or listens to music, dance, drawings, photos, books, video recordings, or electronic media that reflects decadent, carnal, or foul contents, or who performs such acts himself or herself, shall be punished by short-term labor for less than two years. In cases where the person commits a grave offense, he or she shall be punished by reform through labor for less than five years. This doesn't count for the regime's top officials. It seems those guys can beat their meat to the heart's content, or at least that's what some researchers said in 2017. They said deep within the highest offices at Pyongyang, top officials watched American porn sites, such as Pornhub. Those same guys were even going on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, maybe even befriending some of you guys watching this video. As for if someone in North Korea likes people of the same sex, well, that's actually not illegal. But it seems most people don't even have a concept of homosexuality, even if they feel it in every inch of their bones. In 2015, a guy named Ju Sung Ha, who had defected from North Korea after studying at its best university, told the New York Times about homosexuality, In my university, only half the students may have heard of the word. Even then, it was always treated as some strange, vague mental illness affecting subhumans, only found in the depraved West. Also in the Times, another guy said, I was too embarrassed to confess that I came here because I felt no sexual attraction to my wife. I couldn't explain what it was that bothered me so much, made my life so miserable in North Korea, because I didn't know until after I arrived here that I was gay or even what homosexuality was. So while there is no law that outright bans homosexuality, coming out would certainly be taboo, and we imagine might raise a few eyebrows. Article 193 talks about decadent behavior, and it's speculated that a gay person could be charged with this, but it's hard to say. In totalitarian society, these laws are deliberately very vague. A gay defector named Zhang Yongjin said after he jumped the fence he experienced more discrimination in conservative South Korea. Still, since homosexuality isn't even talked about in the North, it's unlikely there will be discrimination. Even the little things can get a person in trouble. Households are expected to be clean and tidy, and people are absolutely expected to have pictures of their leaders on the wall, past and present. In some societies in the world that aren't even totalitarian but are authoritarian, pretty much every household has a picture on the wall of some ruler or monarch. Thailand was like this until the last king died, and people there still will argue with you until they're blue in the face that this was out of love and respect rather than a consequence of propaganda instilled in them since they were just children. Reports say that portraits of leaders in North Korea have to be hung high, so they look down on the occupants of the house. The police do inspections now and again to ensure families follow the rule. If the pictures aren't there, or if they're dirty or hung in the wrong place, the adults in the house can expect punishment. An investigation into their habits and opinions will try to ask ascertain if they're either bad socialists or just rubbish at looking after pictures. It's likely that if they're charged with something, they'll do some time in the mine, or perhaps just have to do the walk of shame at work. The security services will, of course, interview the kids to ensure the parents have been routinely filling their brains with the right thoughts. This must be a nerve-wracking time for the parents whose four-year-old might blurt something that sends mommy and daddy to an early grave. It could be something innocent, such as, mommy said Kim a bad man with dumpling face. This kind of thing would seriously affect the family's songbun, social status ranking.
Westerners don't often feel the wrath of the regime for acting or speaking out of line, but sometimes they do. Merrill Newman, an 85-year-old guy from California, made the mistake in 2013 of telling his North Korean tour guide that he'd fought on the wrong side in the Korean War. This was enough to get him arrested and later appear on CNN confessing his crime. On this trip, I can understand that in U.S. and Western countries, there is misleading information and propaganda about TPRK. He later said that he purposefully used awful grammar in that video so the folks back home would know he'd been forced to say those things. That's why everyone always says things are hunky-dory when they appear on the TV. They have to. Many tourists will tell you that North Korea is okay. The people are friendly, and all the talk of danger is overblown. But that only remains true if you don't break the rules. You can soon be called a hostile, though admittedly you'd have to be stupid or willfully ignorant to break those rules. They're pretty obvious. This doesn't mean that the locals will hate you, even if you come from so-called imperialist America. One American returned from a trip and said to the press, I told them I was American and they were pretty interested and were asking me questions. They didn't seem to be intimidated by America or have any hatred toward America which was reassuring. Still, break the law there, it's at your own risk. You might not see a firing squad like a local, but you might be sent back to the US looking rather under the weather. You've probably already seen our first episode, 50 Insane Facts About North Korea. Did you think we were done? Not even remotely. This is, after all, the number one mass producer of crazy in the world we're talking about. There's always something new and most likely insane to learn about the Hermit Kingdom. And with Dear Leader Kim and President Twitter fingers potentially at each other's throats again, we might as well learn as much as we can about North Korea before the nukes get us all. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Infographics Show. Today we're taking a look at 50 even more insane facts about North Korea. 50. North Korea is the world's only necrocracy, a nation that is still governed by the rules of a former leader, now dead leader. Not to be confused with necromancy. That's when you bring dead dinosaurs back to life with science to open up a theme park for children. 49. North Korea has conducted five nuclear tests since 2006. Despite Western intelligence agencies doubting they would be able to achieve a nuclear breakthrough for another decade. 48. Their last test in 2017 was of a device thought to be 100 kilotons and collapsed the mountain under which it was tested. 47. North Korea's nuclear tests have caused fear of radiation leaks being carried by the wind to Chinese border cities and towns, which lie as close as just 60 miles from the North Korea test site. 46. Further underground tests are feared to cause a volcanic eruption at Mount Paektu, which could be devastating for the North Korean and Chinese countryside. 45. The largest stadium in the world is in Pyongyang. The Rungrado 1st of May Stadium occupies an area of 51 acres and can seat 114,000 people, though has held as many as 150,000 in the past. It's also known as the May Day Stadium. 44. In the late 1990s, several North Korean generals implicated in a plot to assassinate Kim Jong-il were executed in the stadium by burning to death. 43. In 1995, the Japanese New Japan Pro Wrestling and American World Championship Wrestling Leagues held the Collision in Korea pay-per-view event in the May Day Stadium, though its official title was the Pyongyang International Sports and Culture Festival for Peace. 42. When not executing traitorous generals or hosting beefcakes fighting each other in their underwear, the May Day Stadium is best known for the annual Arirang Festival, or as it's known in North Korea, the Grand Mass Gymnastics and Artistic Performance Arirang, because North Korea loves being extremely specific about everything. 41. Taking place annually between 2002 and 2013, with the exception of 2006, the games were cancelled in 2014 but returned in 2018 under the name The Glorious Country. Not enough adjectives if you ask us. 40. North Koreans are handpicked to be part of the Arirang as young as 5 years old and expected to surf in this fashion until retirement age. 39. In August 2007, the Arirang Mass Games were recognized by Guinness World Records as the largest gymnastic display, with 100,090 gymnasts performing at once. 38. Besides not starving to death, other popular sports in North Korea include football, soccer for American viewers, basketball, speed skating, hockey, and of course gymnastics. North Korea even has a small domestic football league that plays all its games in the Kim Jong-il Stadium. 37. June 25th is the start of North Korea's struggle against U.S. imperialism month, 
We bet you can't guess what the central theme is. 36. North Korean propaganda routinely features fictional scenes from the Korean War of Americans committing atrocities. The Sinchon Museum of American War Atrocities commemorates the deaths of more than 35,000 people North Korea claims Americans slaughtered at the start of the Korean War. A completely fabricated event or fake news, it's unknown if the death toll of 35,000 is greater than the US's Bowling Green Massacre. 35. In 2014, Kim Jong-un described Americans as cannibals and homicides, seeking pleasure in slaughter. 34. In 2017, US President Trump took to the most hallowed of international diplomatic tools known as Twitter and called Kim Jong-un Little Rocket Man and alluded that he was short and fat. In response, Kim called President Trump a mentally deranged US dotard on a televised broadcast. And that's how the world works now. 33. Despite this exchange of nuclear insults, Kim invited President Trump to a face-to-face -face meeting and removed a great deal of anti-American propaganda from their prominent displays all over Pyongyang. 32. After an initial bromance for the ages, things however seem to have cooled down considerably and Kim Jong-un is widely reported to be secretly resuming his nuclear program while lying about his intentions. Foreign policy experts around the world were in shock at the revelation that a murderous dictator who maintains his grip on power through fear and violence was not being honest about his intentions. 31. A key feature of North Korean propaganda is the on-the-spot guidance, a tool meant to further the image of a caring, omniscient, and great leader offering benevolent guidance to ordinary workers and citizens. Typically, these take the form of highly choreographed visits to factories and farms around the nation and serve to further build a cult of personality built around the Kim family. 30. Every year, state-owned publishing houses release several cartoons called Giram Chaik, which mostly feature scheming capitalists from the US or Japan creating dilemmas for naive North Korean characters. 29. In 2004 and 2005, North Korea aired a television program entitled Let's Trim Our Hair in Accordance with the Socialist Lifestyle. The show featured acceptable and proper hairstyles and claimed that hair can affect human intelligence because it deprives the rest of the body of nutrients as it grows. 28. Another television program featured a hidden camera in Pyongyang, which would catch citizens with improper hairstyles. Those caught would be interviewed by the presenter and asked to explain themselves. Their name, address, and workplace would then be announced to deter others. 27. The North Korean village of Kijongdong is situated along the Korean DMZ, and North Korea claims it houses 200 families who work collective farms in the area. However, closer inspection with telescopic devices has shown that the brightly colored buildings are empty and don't have window glass or even an interior. 26. The village, also known as Propaganda Village, is meant to entice South Korean defectors. To date, only a few dozen have tried to defect to North Korea, while many thousands have fled to South Korea. 25. In 2013, six men and one woman defected to North Korea after one of them posted a series of pro-North Korean messages online, which were shared by the country's main newspaper. Thinking he would be welcome into the country, he and six others made the trek into the north. 24. Upon entering the country, all seven defectors were thrown into prison for up to 45 months. One man claimed he was kept in solitary confinement the entire time, and another of the men strangled his wife and then tried to kill himself in a suicide pact. North Korean officials claimed the woman died because of a quarrel with her husband. 23. After being returned to South Korea, the survivors faced up to 10 years imprisonment for their attempt to defect to the North. 22. North Korea maintains a secret network of informants that spy on their fellow citizens and report criminal or subversive behavior, such as listening to non-state radio or TV broadcasts or watching foreign films. 21. North Korea's most popular tourist attraction is visiting Kim Jong-il's preserved body. 20. It is a widely known fact in North Korea that Kim Jong-un learned how to drive at the age of three and is a skilled composer and musician. 19. Kim Jong-il's birth was prophesized by a swallow and signaled by a double rainbow over Mount Paektu and the appearance of a new star in the sky. 18. Kim Jong-il started walking at three weeks old and began speaking at eight weeks. 17. While attending Kim Il-sung University, Kim Jong-il authored 1,500 books in three years and composed six full operas. The operas are naturally widely recognized as the greatest in the history of music, both past, present, and future. 16. Kim Jong-il also invented, completely on his own, a delicacy called Gogigwiopang, 
which is described as double bread with meat. In the rest of the world, it's called a hamburger. 15. It's well documented that Kim Jong-il could control the weather with his mood, and that he had magical abilities that helped him control the weather. 14. Kim Jong-il holds the record for the best round in the history of the game of golf, having shot 38 under par, 25 shots better than the world record, and scoring 11 holes in one. 13. Imperialist capitalist psychologists around the world claim that Kim Jong-il actually suffered from the Big Six group of personality disorders, making him paranoid, antisocial, narcissistic, sadistic, schizoid, and schizotypal. It's believed Hitler, Hussein, and Stalin also suffered from these disorders. 12. Kim Jong-il was completely obsessed with his rice. He made female staff inspect each grain individually to ensure they had the right length, weight, and color, and insisted it only be cooked over a fire made with wood taken from trees that only grew on a particular Chinese mountain. 11. Recuperating from injuries after falling off his horse, Kim became so terrified of becoming addicted to painkillers that he forced others around him to take the same dosage he did so he wouldn't get hooked alone. 10. In 2016, North Korea claimed to have produced a miracle drug made of rare earth elements which could cure AIDS, most cancers, and destroy the Ebola virus. Unfortunately for us, North Korean scientists declined to share details about the ingredients or how to manufacture the drug. 9. For years, North Korean propaganda claimed that the deer leaders didn't poop. The poopless image of the current deer leader, Kim Jong-un, was shattered, however, when it was revealed that he had a mobile toilet built into one of the vehicles of his personal convoy for when he traveled around the country. 8. Any other North Korean official found using the deer toilet would face severe punishment, to include death. 7. In 2012, the Korean Central News Agency informed the world that North Korean researchers from the Academy of Social Sciences had discovered a unicorn lair. The lair must not have been particularly difficult to spot, as it was only 200 meters away from a temple and featured a rectangular rock with the words unicorn lair written on it. 6. Just days before the unicorn story hit the international news, China's Communist Party newspaper ran a story hailing a report by The Onion naming Kim Jong-un as the sexiest man alive, not realizing it was satire. This is really why you need a free and independent press, guys. 5. North Korea claims it has no citizens with disabilities, but defectors claim that officials kill babies with disabilities and that men with dwarfism are castrated and forced to live in an isolated village. 4. When Kim Jong-il passed away, the Korean Central News Agency reported that ice formed over a holy lake cracked, lights lit up the top of a sacred mountain, and snowstorms hit parts of the country at the moment he died. They also reported that flocks of magpies grieved in front of a statue of Kim Jong-il and his father Kim Il-sung. 3. In 2016, North Korea invented a new type of beer that wouldn't lead to hangovers despite an alcohol content of 40%. Sadly for the frat bros around the world, North Korea to date hasn't shared the recipe with the world or given any hint that it actually exists. 2. In 2010, articles in North Korea claimed that Kim Jong-il had set a global fashion trend with his modest gray suits, which, quote, leave a deep impression on people's minds in the world, unquote. 1. A total of four U.S. soldiers defected to North Korea during or after the Korean War, the most famous of which was James Joseph Dresnok. He became a national celebrity, portraying American villages in various anti-American feature films and television shows. He died in November 2016 of a stroke and told his sons to remain loyal to Kim Jong-un and that they would destroy the U.S. if it launched an attack against North Korea. There have been some great prison escapes over the years, as prisoners made a run from captivity using raging waters and perilous forests pursued by trained guards and ruthless dogs. But how would you escape from prison if your prison was a whole country? That was the challenge facing one man who found himself in the most tightly controlled dictatorship in the world, North Korea. Imprisoned in one of the most notorious prison camps in the world, he faced a seemingly impossible task, become the only person ever to escape from the total control zone. Shin Dong-hyuk was born a prisoner at the Kechon internment camp, also known as Camp 14 in North Korea. North Korea is full of prison camps, but Kechon is a total control zone, a labor camp reserved for the prisoners they want to subject to the harshest treatment. In North Korea, that's not just the political dissidents who question or challenge the Kim regime, but their relatives and even their descendants who weren't born at the time of the crime. The crimes of Shin Dong-hyuk's family were unknown, but his parents had displayed good behavior in the camp 
His father told Shin that his wife had been given to him as a reward for his work in the machine shop. Because so much of the day was devoted to hard labor, Shin almost never saw his father, and food was so scarce that he had to compete with his mother and brother for limited rations. The cruel guards constantly told Shin that he had to work to prove himself, and that any disobedience could get him executed. In Camp 14, family wasn't family, they were rivals and threats. The closest thing Shin had to a normal childhood experience was when he went to school, but even there, the harsh reality of life in a total control zone was inescapable. Lessons did not even mention the country they lived in. And as for physical education, forget about dodgeball and running laps. Students were sent out as laborers to keep the camp looking clean and to work on industrial products. Even in school, the threat of harsh punishment or worse was inescapable, as Kim once saw a girl beaten to death for hoarding food. Why was the Kim family's cult of personality completely missing from the Kaechon internment camp? Because the families trapped there weren't being rehabilitated or taught to be loyal citizens, they had already been written off for the society and weren't part of Kim's ideal society. From an early age, Shin learned that he had to fight to survive and death could lurk around every corner. They only got enough food to survive, barely, and starvation level hunger was a constant. The only option was to forage for food and pick weeds or capture small animals for eating, unless you were willing to work as an informant. The guards were always on the lookout for inmates committing minor infractions that, in a prison camp in North Korea, were death penalty crimes. Shin witnessed dozens of executions during his childhood, many of whom were reported by other inmates for food rewards. Shin started telling the guards what he saw, but it didn't save him from punishments, including harsh beatings for mistakes during work detail. He even lost part of a finger when his supervisor chopped it off after he broke a sewing machine. Unlike most North Korean labor camps, Kaechon was for those deemed completely unredeemable, and no one there had any hope of release. Even those born in the camp were considered irredeemable for their bloodline, and the only purpose the inmates had was labor. You chose an industry, worked hard, and hoped the guards didn't object to anything you did. The ultimate goal was to be chosen for a position in livestock because you had access to the animal food and could steal a few bits away when the guards weren't looking. Some inmates were even desperate enough that they would root through the animal droppings hoping to find a few grains of undigested corn. Yum. Shin had never experienced life outside the camp and didn't know anything else, but his mother was a different story. She was desperate to escape, and she began plotting an escape with his older brother. One day, 13-year-old Shin overheard them talking about the escape plan, and he became jealous that she had prepared a better meal of rice for his brother instead of the soupy corn porridge he had eaten. Resentful, he saw an opportunity to better his situation in the camp and decided to tell his teacher, but the teacher at the school wasn't available, so he told the night guard at his school. This backfired horribly, as the night guard claimed he had discovered the information on his own. Instead of being rewarded, Shin was arrested along with his entire family. He was tortured horribly for four days as the guards demanded to know what he knew and used fire and hooks to force information out of him. He was left with horrible scars all along his body and was left in a tiny cell for seven months. Finally, the guards realized that Shin and his father weren't part of the conspiracy. They were taken out of their cells and placed in a car and driven back to the camp. When they arrived, there was a horrible surprise waiting for them. It was the execution of Shin's mother and brother. He and his father were forced to watch, and for the first time, Shin realized the gravity of what he had done and the horrors of the camp he lived in. He knew he had to get out. Shin's eyes had been opened, and everywhere around him he saw terror and violence. He was allowed to return to his job at the textile factory, and there he met a man who would become his partner in the next stage of his journey to freedom. His name was Park, and he wasn't like Shin. He hadn't spent his entire life in the camp. A former citizen of Pyongyang, he was one of North Korea's more well-traveled citizens, having traveled to the communist countries of East Germany and China. While both countries were oppressive, there was much more freedom to learn there and different things to experience. He claimed to have shook Supreme Leader Kim Jong-il's hand, and Shin was fascinated by his stories. Park told Shin all about the world that existed outside the camp, especially about the food. Virtually every meal Shin had eaten in his life had been the same gruel of corn and cabbage, maybe with an insect or rat he caught. With every word Park told Shin, Shin became more determined. He would complete the journey his mother and brother started. Shin and Park formed a pact to escape, each bringing their own unique skills to the task. Shin knew the camp inside and out, in fact he knew nothing but it, while Park was a new inmate and wouldn't be able to escape without Shin's help. But outside the camp, Shin would be helpless and Park promised to guide him to safety. They just needed an opportunity, 
and it presented itself on January 2, 2005. Work details were assigned randomly, and they had to be aware of their surroundings at every moment. When they were assigned to work near the dangerous electric fence, they saw that the guards were taking longer than usual to make a circuit. They only had a few minutes, but as soon as the guards were out of sight, they made their move. Park attempted to climb the electric fence, but the high-voltage system wasn't designed to provide gentle shocks. No one left Keichon internment camp alive, one way or another. As soon as Park tried to climb it, he received a fatal shock, but in dying, gave his partner one last opportunity. His body was positioned in a way that Shin could use him to ground the current and make it through the fence. His body was hit by brutal electric shocks, even with the extra protection, and his legs were horribly burned when they brushed the lowest wire. Shin was terribly wounded and in agonizing pain, but for the first time in his life, he was free. The guards hadn't noticed him yet, and Shin knew he had to move fast. He broke into the nearest house outside the camp which belonged to a farmer and was lucky enough to find an old military uniform. No one had ever seen him outside the camp, so he was able to impersonate a North Korean soldier. Now it was time to learn about the world outside, starting with money. He stole a bag of rice and sold it to some hungry people, and that allowed him his first taste of luxury, cookies, which were one of the first sweet things he had ever tasted, and cigarettes. But he knew word of an escape from the camp would soon get out, and he had to keep moving. He eventually made his way to the northern border with China, and North Korea's brutal conditions worked in his favor. The border guards were starving too, and when Shin bribed them with food and cigarettes, they let him through. Shin Dong-hyuk had done the near impossible, escaped North Korea. Shin was terrified he would be caught and sent back, so he stayed under the radar in China. He was used to hard labor, so working as a migrant worker around China was the easiest way to survive. But when a journalist found him in a Shanghai restaurant and discovered his story, he was taken to the South Korean embassy and was able to claim asylum. After interrogation, much less harsh than he was used to, he was cleared of any suspicion of being a North Korean agent, and he could tell his story to the world. He released a Korean memoir, moved to America, and told his story to journalist Blaine Hardin. He became famous, worked for the nonprofit Liberty in North Korea, and even spoke before the United Nations. For the first time, people outside of North Korea were hearing a first-hand account of the horrors inside the Kim regime's prison camp. His memoir, Escape from Camp 14, One Man's Remarkable Odyssey from North Korea to Freedom in the West, became essential reading around the world. But there was one more twist to the story. As Shin Dong-hyuk's story spread, the North Koreans realized that he was spreading their darkest secrets. In 2012, they released their own version of the story. At first, they denied he had ever been one of their prisoners, and later identified him as having been born Shin in Gwen. They aired an interview with his father and other witnesses who claimed that his story was false or exaggerated. His father claimed Shin hadn't been born in Camp 14 and was sent there not because his family were dissidents, but because of a terrible sex crime. He claimed that Shin's mother and brother weren't accused of plotting an escape, but were convicted of murder. Shin claimed that he had heard those rumors, but they weren't true. The North Korean propaganda effort continued as they worked to discredit Shin's story, until one fateful day in 2015. Shin contacted Blaine Hardin, and a new edition of the book was released. Shin now revealed in a foreword that he had embellished his story for dramatic purposes and revealed new details. He now claimed that he was born in Camp 14 but spent years at the less harsh Camp 18. He admitted to falsely implicating his mother and brother in a murder, which he says is something he'll regret to his dying day. He also revealed two failed escape attempts from Camp 18 that led to him being tortured and returned to Camp 14. But the one thing he never wavered on was the details of his escape from Camp 14, the sacrifice of Park, and his desperate run for freedom. Although many questioned if Shin Dong-hyuk was still a credible witness to North Korean prison camps, he never stopped advocating for freedom from the country he was born in, and never stopped appreciating his new home. If you ask him today what freedom means to him, he'll say roast chicken, a symbol of his escape from starvation to plenty. Imagine that you're a Canadian citizen who spent the last 20 years doing charity work in North Korea. You've visited the Hermit Kingdom more than 150 times without incident, which is why it's such a shock when one night out of the blue, you're kidnapped, uh, well, we mean arrested, from your hotel room and accused of being an enemy of the state. Have you ever wondered what are prisons like in North Korea? Well, you're about to find out. This might seem like a far-fetched tale, but believe it or not, this is exactly what happened to a South Korean Canadian pastor who spent 919 days imprisoned in North Korea. His story is terrifying and brutal, but remarkably, he's one of the lucky ones. Many others who have experienced the horrors of North Korean prison firsthand have much, much darker tales to tell, but we'll get to that. First, let's find out how a Canadian pastor found himself on the wrong side of a tyrannical regime and ended up on the wrong side of a North Korean prison fence. 
Young Soo Lim was born in South Korea and moved to Canada as a young man, where he became a Christian pastor, married, and raised a family. Pastor Lim traveled back to South Korea often to visit his mother and, while there, began doing charity work with the poor just over the border in North Korea. Over the next 20 years, Pastor Lim would travel to North Korea more than 150 times. He was one of the few people in the world who had a special green Nexus-like ID card that allowed him to cross the notoriously difficult border dozens of times without incident. In January 2015, while Pastor Lim was visiting his mother in South Korea, he was contacted by a North Korean tourism official who requested an urgent meeting with him. Pastor Lim was surprised but not concerned, and he knew that when dealing with North Korean government officials, the safest option was just to go along with whatever they said. When Pastor Lim arrived at the border, a government official informed him that this meeting had been moved to a city 17 hours away by car. Pastor Lim knew better than to argue, so he threw his plans for a quick day trip out the window and got into the waiting car, a decision that would come back to haunt him. Shortly after Pastor Lim checked into the hotel room that had been so graciously arranged for him, six men armed with handguns rushed into the room, blindfolded him and hustled him out of the hotel and into the back of a waiting vehicle. Pastor Lim begged the officers to tell him what was happening, where they were taking him and if he was under arrest, but they ignored his desperate pleas. He was taken to a detention center near Pyongyang and deposited in a prison cell with no explanation. The dark, dank cell had no windows or furniture, just a concrete floor and a moldy toilet and sink. After weeks of interrogation, Pastor Lim finally learned what it was that had landed him in this hell. Uh, cell. Apparently, someone in power had caught wind of one of his sermons on YouTube, in which he tells his flock not to treat the ruling Kim family as gods. Apparently, this was enough to have him labeled as an enemy of the state, and he was charged with harming the dignity of the supreme leadership of the country and trying to use religion to destroy the government. As relieved as Pastor Kim was to finally understand why he was here, he knew this was not good news. If found guilty, which, let's face it, he knew he would be, he could face life in a North Korean prison, or worse. After more than a year imprisoned in the small dank cell at the detention center, Pastor Lim realized his only hope was to confess and pray for mercy, otherwise he would die in his cell. In true North Korean form, Pastor Lim's trial was swift and his sentence was brutal. He was quickly proclaimed guilty and initially sentenced to death. Before Pastor Lim could wrap his mind around his impending fate, the judges conferred and, likely swayed by the presence of some Canadian diplomats, they downgraded his sentence to life in a labor prison. Unbelievably, relief washed over Pastor Lim as he realized his life had been spared, but that feeling wouldn't last long. He was about to find out what prison in North Korea is like. Life in North Korea is a bit of a prison sentence in and of itself. The country is so isolated and cut off from the outside world that it's earned the nickname of the Hermit Kingdom. While elite members of the authoritarian ruling class live in outrageous luxury, 40% of the North Korean population is malnourished. Tens of millions of North Korean citizens are trapped in a life of hard labor and extreme poverty, and under the tyrannical rule of Kim Jong-un and his cronies, they have little chance of improving their situation. They can only hope not to get on the wrong side of any power-hungry government officials, lest they find themselves in a true North Korean prison. Kim Jong-un is the all-powerful supreme leader of the so-called Democratic People's Republic of Korea, and he has unlimited control over all aspects of the lives of his citizens. As dictator of the Hermit Kingdom of North Korea, Kim Jong-un also presides over its appalling prison system. While North Korea officially denies the existence of these gulag-like prison camps, numerous reports from North Korean defectors as well as covert investigations into conditions in the country have revealed that not only do these atrocious camps exist, but they might be worse than anyone thought. Pastor Lim's experience in one of these prisons would expose some of the horrifying conditions faced by North Korean prisoners. After his trial, Pastor Lim was immediately whisked from the courtroom and into yet another waiting vehicle. He was forced to keep his head between his knees during the drive so he couldn't see where he was, until they arrived at an imposing concrete and barbed wire building in the middle of nowhere, Pastor Lim's new home, possibly for the rest of his life. Pastor Lim's new cell was hardly an improvement over his last one, but at least now he had a bed with a thin mattress, although he soon found it was infested with cockroaches. The building's tap water was undrinkable and the food was terrible. Rice full of dirt and thin white bread day after day, with a weekly boiled egg as a prized treat. The meager rations were not nearly enough to sustain him through the days of hard labor. Pastor Lim spent hours each day digging holes for apple trees in an orchard. Pastor Lim quickly began to fade away, losing 50 pounds or more than a third of his body weight and developing painful arthritis in his hands from digging in the sometimes frozen dirt. 
At one point, Pastor Lim was even hospitalized for two months before being shipped directly back to prison as soon as he recovered the tiniest bit of strength. Still, Pastor Lim focused on his faith and kept his spirits up as best he could. Over time, he was allowed more privileges, including a Bible and his much-needed blood pressure medication. He was soon allowed some limited contact with his wife, connected with some Canadian officials, and even gave a carefully controlled and government-approved TV interview. Pastor Lim even developed relationships with some of the guards, even helping one of them learn to connect with his teenage son. August 9, 2017 began like any other day. Pastor Lim was digging holes in the orchard when a guard came to him and told him to return to his cells and pack his things. He hardly dared to believe his dreams were coming true, as he was ushered into a hotel conference room full of Canadian and North Korean officials, signed his release papers, and boarded a plane headed for home. After 919 days in a North Korean prison, Pastor Lim was free. As horrifying as his ordeal was, Pastor Lim knows that he was one of the lucky ones. He didn't see a single other prisoner during his time in the North Korean prison, and he suspects that his Canadian citizenship spared him the worst of the harsh treatment experienced by North Korean prisoners. He even says he would consider going back to North Korea if allowed, and that seems insane to us, but to each his own, we guess. Even foreign citizenship isn't always enough to protect someone who finds themselves in a North Korean prison. In June 2017, an American student named Otto Warmbier died after he was found unresponsive in his cell in a North Korean prison. He had been serving a 15-year hard labor sentence for allegedly attempting to leave the country with a propaganda poster. Many others who've witnessed the horrors of a North Korean prison firsthand have much darker stories to tell. A former guard at one of those infamous prisons who defected to South Korea has exposed some of the most horrifying details of what goes on behind the barbed wire gates of a North Korean prison. She explains how the guards were manipulated and brainwashed to look at the prisoners as less than human. They were told that the prisoners were horrible monsters who had committed terrible crimes, though she was later devastated to learn that in many cases their crimes were no worse than foraging for food to feed their starving family or simply just being a Christian. In many cases, multiple generations of entire families were imprisoned together for the crimes of one family member in an effort to weed out the bad seeds. Once the guards could dehumanize the prisoners, they were able to treat them with a new level of brutality. On top of severe starvation and extreme physical labor to the point of collapse, guards would often brutally beat prisoners for the slightest indiscretion. Once the former guard recalled an entire family, including children, being brutally beaten in retaliation for two of their family members escaping. The escapees were later caught and paraded through a crowd of prisoners who were forced to throw stones at the pair before they were publicly executed by beheading. In case you're trying to convince yourself that North Korean prisons couldn't possibly be as bad as the rumors and stories make them sound, you can rest assured that in reality it's actually much worse than we could have imagined. In 2017, the International Bar Association, that's the global professional association of the world's lawyers so pretty legit, released the findings of their extensive investigation into the Democratic People's Republic of Korea's Kualiso prison system, and the report is sickening. Seriously, if you're squeamish, you might want to skip ahead about a minute or so. We're not kidding. Okay, so here it goes. Don't say we didn't warn you. According to the IAB's report, these are just a few of the worst atrocities committed in North Korean prisons. The report cites numerous incidents of prisoners being beaten and even executed for hiding food or digging for edible roots in the forests near the camp. There were countless reports of routine public executions of prisoners by hanging, beheading, or firing squad designed to subdue and demoralize the prison population. In one camp alone, a reported 1,500 to 2,000 prisoners, many just children, are starved and overworked to death each year. The report goes on to list many, many more accounts of similar atrocities at North Korean prisons. If you skip that last bit, we don't blame you. The truth about what prison is like in North Korea is not for the faint of heart. Thomas Bergenthal, one of the three judges on the IBA's panel, has a half-century of experience working on human rights cases, and he himself is a childhood survivor of the Auschwitz concentration camp. He has witnessed firsthand some of the worst human rights violations in recent history, and even he was shocked by the brutality of North Korea's prisons. He said, Conditions in the North Korean prison camps are as terrible or even worse than those I saw and experienced in my youth in the Nazi camps and in my long professional career in the human rights field. That's pretty damning to say the least. As long as Supreme Leader Kim Jong-un maintains absolute control over North Korea and the lives of its people and prisoners, daily life in North Korea will continue to resemble a prison sentence, and those unlucky enough to find themselves behind bars in North Korea will likely face the most inhumane conditions imaginable. Now that you know what prison in North Korea is like, 
perhaps you'll rethink that summer vacation to Pyongyang. Rolls Royces, the latest iPad, and purses? The things the US won't allow Kim Jong-un and the rest of North Korea to buy might leave you scratching your head. North Korea has been under sanctions for a long time, starting in the 1950s during the Korean War. The communist government, ruled by the Kim family since its founding, has never been recognized by its neighbor to the south, and the peninsula has been in a constant state of tension. After bombings in the 1980s against South Korean targets, the United States tightened the sanctions and declared North Korea a sponsor of terror. But surprisingly, South Korea wasn't always on board, and their liberal government called for engagement. But that was about to change in an explosive way. While Bill Clinton signed the bill in 1994 lessening the sanctions, the country ramped up its nuclear program. In 2003, they withdrew from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and began conducting nuclear tests. This time, the sanctions would be international, passed by the UN Security Council. While they originally focused on weapons-related items, they were expanded to luxury goods and financial assets, as well as restricting the travel of top North Korean officials. The goal was to take away the comforts that the regime was used to and make them more likely to come to the table. Easier said than done. It was 2018 and the Trump administration was hoping to improve diplomatic conditions between the US and North Korea. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo visited the isolated country to press Kim Jong-un to give up his country's nuclear weapons and liberalize the country. Instead, the veteran diplomat got in-your-face proof that the latest ruler of the country was violating the sanctions. He was riding around in a custom Rolls-Royce Phantom limousine, one of the many luxury brands that aren't allowed to do business with North Korea. So, how easy is it to get around international sanctions? It's not easy, but it's far from impossible. UN official Hugh Griffiths had been tracking North Korea's business dealings around the world for years, tracking all their violations. Most of the violations were in hard-to-track resources like petroleum, as well as in currency transfers that allowed them to make purchases clandestinely. But a Rolls-Royce was something else entirely. This was a large, visible purchase that could only come from one source, one that knew better than to deal directly with the regime. And officials worried that if they could sneak in a luxury car, they could sneak in anything. Doing business with North Korea is tricky. Not only are businesses hesitant to send representatives to a country where one wrong move could land you in prison, but violating the sanctions could land you in serious trouble back home. First, you've got to have a license to even buy from them. Not that the Hermit Kingdom has many exports. While there isn't a blanket trade restriction on the country like there is on other nations in conflict with the US, there are a lot of regulations to follow. First, about 100 individuals and companies have been specifically banned from trade due to their links to banned activities. And even if you're not violating these, be careful what you sell. The US and European Union both have lists of goods that can't be sold to the isolated country. This includes items as obvious as weapons and energy supplies that might boost their nuclear program and as random as expensive cigars. Many vehicles are banned from sale as well, not just cars like the mysterious Rolls-Royce, but including the luxury yachts plutocrats love to sail around on. Certain electronics like computers are banned as well, possibly for security reasons, as access could help Kim Jong-un's cyber experts target major systems, but the banned items also include high-end handbags and even caviar. Bad news for any fish with tasty eggs within North Korea's borders. Of course, the fact that these items are banned from sale in North Korea only means that when they get smuggled into the country, they become a huge status symbol. If you thought rocking that new Gucci bag was a big flex, imagine rocking it in a country where it's literally against international law to sell one. And there are several other stumbling blocks along the way. People who want to trade with North Korea may be able to do it legally, but they won't be encouraged. The federal government has programs for loans to fund trade deals, but organizations like the Export-Import Bank won't participate if the seller is looking to do business with a Marxist-Leninist state. North Korea also doesn't have much spare money lying around that we know of, so overall trade with the country remains very low. In 2012, there was only $12 million worth of trade to North Korea, compared to a massive $39 billion to South Korea, a country with twice its population. But just because the sanctions are in place doesn't mean everyone follows them. The United Nations requires member nations to report on their trade to North Korea. But this isn't regulated as strictly as you might think. With 195 UN member states and observer states, a majority of them haven't filed the proper reports on their trade with the Hermit Kingdom. Maybe some don't even have any, and there isn't anything to report. But for others, they may be trying to cover up some dirty little secrets. North Korea is getting supplies from somewhere, and the world is starting to look a little closer. And most people are looking in the direction of one country. China has long been playing both sides of the fence when it comes to North Korea. The Asian juggernaut has one of only two borders with North Korea and the only one that isn't heavily militarized. The countries have a mutual aid and cooperation treaty and regular diplomatic relations, although North Korea's nuclear program has caused serious tension. 
but not serious enough to stop China from being North Korea's top trade partner. In 2009 alone, China sold $136 million in luxury goods to their neighbor, including banned goods like tobacco, electronics, and vehicles. But how do they get away with it in the face of the international sanctions? Where does a bear go first in a town? Anywhere it wants to. China is a powerful and influential country, and they've had several brushes with international pressure. They provide a significant portion of trade to most countries on Earth, including the US, and sanctioning them for violating North Korean sanctions could backfire if they take their business elsewhere. And the ban on luxury goods in the UN sanctions doesn't list exactly what they are. It leaves that up to each country, so there's no way to police exactly what China sells to North Korea, as long as it isn't something actively dangerous like weapons. But even beyond China, North Korea is finding a way. It's estimated that the Hermit Kingdom spends over half a billion dollars importing luxury goods every year. So where do they get their money, and how do they get them into the borders? The answer is usually with a lot more steps. When it comes to importing vital energy supplies like coal and petroleum, which are strictly capped to stop the country from using them on weapons programs, the country usually gets them offshore. By doing transfers of petroleum and coal on the open seas, the country keeps the transfers from being logged against their yearly limits. The ships then head back to home base and unload while flying the North Korean flag. And there's another big way they skirt sanctions – shell corporations. These are companies that exist only on paper. They don't have an office or even employees, which means they're extremely hard to trace if they commit any illegal activities. They usually have a bank account and own assets, which can be seized if they get caught in the act. But this is normally a write-off for a larger and more powerful company. There's no higher level to sanction or punish, no matter what they do. This is why shell companies are often clandestinely set up through third parties for some of the most powerful people and companies in the world. And when it comes to getting around sanctions, there is no better way. The most common purposes for shell companies include tax evasion and money laundering, as well as hiding assets from lawsuits or an angry ex-wife. But companies could easily still pass their luxury goods from the main company to a hard-to-trace shell company to another one until it reaches North Korea and Kim Jong-un finally gets to enjoy that caviar he'd been craving. With no paper trail between the original seller and the company that finally delivers it, it's one of the best ways to get away with an illegal transaction. But if that transaction's a little too visible, watch out. When Kim Jong-un arrived at the summit in his flashy Rolls-Royce limo, it wasn't just a nice ride, it was a blatant admission that he was violating the sanctions and he didn't care if the US and UN knew it. It was also a prominent luxury item that could be immediately identified and was a massive black eye for the company behind the high-end cars and limos, BMW. The German corporation was under a lot of pressure to explain how one of their cars wound up behind North Korean borders in violation of international sanctions. The problem was, no one was sure if they even knew. Luxury goods change hands often, and the limousine might have fallen out of the parent company's hands long ago. The images were public and investigators quickly looked over the limousine for any indicators of how it got there. They had previously traced another limousine in North Korea back to the Chinese businessman who sold it and started cracking down on the smuggling ring that delivered it. They hoped to duplicate the same success here, but North Korea had gotten better at covering its tracks. This was big business after all. The car was worth almost half a million dollars, and the investigators weren't going to get any answers out the reclusive leader. They were able to identify that it was in fact an authentic Rolls-Royce limo and went to the manufacturer, but the company was tight-lipped, either not wanting to admit any liability or not wanting to admit that their security had let this slip by. They were only willing to give some information about when the limo could have been made, between 2012 and 2017, and then they clammed up about further details. Was BMW in bed with the North Korean government? In the past, the UN officials had quizzed other companies about how their cars wound up in the Hermit Kingdom, and the answers led the authorities to large smuggling rings. While punishing governments, especially powerful ones like China, for violating the sanctions can be near impossible, it's a lot easier to nab small fish who make the smuggling rings work. And with those guys facing lengthy prison terms, they're often willing to flip on who's pulling the strings behind the scenes. But for that mystery Rolls Royce, a lot of questions are unanswered. The company has failed to give the UN its vehicle ID number, and the investigation is stalled. It seems the Kim's taste in luxury cars hasn't gotten any cheaper. Not long after the Rolls Royce, he was seen riding around Pyongyang in an armored Mercedes. So the pipeline is still going strong, as Kim Jong-un snubs his nose at the international sanctions and demonstrates to the world that they might be able to keep him from importing things above board, but they can't ruin his champagne tastes. Even as North Korea suffers from widespread food and electricity shortages, smuggling keeps its leader in luxury. But reports from within the kingdom indicate that even powerful government agencies might be struggling to find the money they need to keep operating. As the sanctions work, those looking for a connection to the outside world will turn to back channels. After all, there's money to be made, and where there's an opportunity, the smugglers will find a way. 
Hitler had his concentration camps, Stalin had his gulags, and North Korea has its dreaded labor camps. Every evil dictatorship has historically had a place to send any dissidents or perceived enemies of the state. And while many horror stories have circulated about the cruelty and brutality of North Korea's prison camps, exact details have been hard to confirm due to the secretive nature of the Hermit Kingdom. Yet as more North Koreans escape the brutal regime, never before heard details paint a grim picture of life inside one of the most hellish places on Earth. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Infographics Show. Today we're going to remind you to be grateful that you live a comfortable first world life as we answer the question, what do we know about North Korean labor camps? For most of our viewers, watching our show is nothing but an afterthought. But did you know that in North Korea, watching the infographics show can get you sent straight to a labor camp for 10 years? Not just our show, of course, but anything on the public internet. In fact, just owning a computer can be offense enough to warrant a trip to a labor camp, as computer ownership requires explicit permission from the government itself. And if you want to cruise the internet, you'll have to make do with a state-operated intranet. With internet access afforded only to government personnel, anyone caught circumventing this ban is going to earn themselves a one-way trip to the modern gulag. But don't worry, because you won't be lonely in your new prison home. And that's thanks to North Korean founder Kim Il-sung's belief that evil could only be expunged from a family if you punished three generations of that family. So if your dad gets sent to a prison camp, then you're going right along with him along with your sister, mom, and any immediate family, even if you're the model North Korean citizen. Then if you have a child in prison, that child will live out his or her days in that prison as well. But what is life like inside the prison camps? And what do they do exactly? Well, as many dictators have found throughout history, locking up dissidents is a pretty okay solution, and executing them outright is even better. However, why just lock them up or kill them when you can capitalize on the free labor that a prison population affords? Stalin most famously put tens of thousands of gulag prisoners to work in the Soviet Union in a bid to modernize his nation. In fact, Soviet political prisoners built much of modern Russia's infrastructure, to include the famous Moscow Canal, which was built by 200,000 prisoners, many of which died from the extreme conditions. Today you can even take a romantic cruise down the Moscow Canal, literally sailing over the buried remains of slaves and on waters tamed by pure human misery, just the thing to really set the mood. For North Korea, free labor is a very appealing prospect especially since the nation is so economically impoverished. Prison laborers are often used in North Korea's mining industry, working without power tools and usually just pickaxes and shovels, and with absolutely zero safety regulations. Prisoners also farm food which is sent to Pyongyang, though of course they're not allowed to eat any of it, and if caught, they can be shot. Many camps include consumer goods such as furniture which goes on sale in Pyongyang department stores, while others create building materials to be used around the country. While this free labor pool must seem like a pretty convenient system for North Korea's dictators, the reality is that study after study shows that slave labor is far more inefficient than paid labor, and in actuality often costs more both in direct cost of security and in lost revenue due to inefficiency. Russia's famous Moscow Canal is estimated to have actually cost Russia millions of rubles due to the poor workmanship and slow progress of slave labor. So what are the conditions actually like inside the camp? Thankfully, the flood of North Korean defectors has revealed the secrets of these literal hells on earth. First, the camps resemble villages more than actual camps, with guards and their families living next to the camp itself. While some are fenced, many are not, and the extreme remoteness and hostile terrain coupled with the terrible nutrition of its prisoners is often enough to keep people from trying to flee. Then there's also the fact that guards will shoot on sight if anyone even appears to be running away, and if they can't catch you, they'll kill your family members which are left behind. Though guards are extremely motivated to catch prisoners, because often if a runaway succeeds in escaping, the guards themselves will be executed, all in the name of preventing the secrets of forced labor camps from escaping the country. Guards themselves routinely, physically, and sexually abuse prisoners. Rape is rampant, and much like in the Soviet Gulag, female prisoners may trade sexual favors for a few bits more to eat, or simply be forced into the act by a guard. Prisoners are routinely beaten for even the most minor infractions, though the abuse isn't limited just to the guards. Because the families of guards often live at the camps themselves as well, family members happily get in on the abuse. One prisoner at a mining camp explained how family members of prison guards would order miners to kneel before them with their mouths open, 
and then they would spit phlegm directly into their mouths. If a prisoner spit it out, they would be beaten. But this prisoner said that you would gag immediately upon receiving a big wad of mucus in your mouth, which would be excuse enough for the tormentor to beat you. Sometimes though the beatings come from your fellow prisoners. One prisoner recounts how she and several other prisoners were forced to sit in the lotus position and not allowed to move or stretch their limbs. After several hours of this, someone would inevitably move, which prompted the guards to order the other prisoners to beat this person. Grateful for the opportunity to stretch their own limbs, the prisoners would beat the offending prisoner mercilessly, knowing this was the only exercise they would get. Letting prisoners punish themselves is a favorite tactic for prison guards, and often prisoners would be punished as a group for the offenses of just one prisoner. One former prisoner explained how guards would withhold food, or in winter would not provide heating, nor allow the prisoners to build a fire. The stressed and angry prisoners would then vent their frustration on the offending prisoner, often beating them to death. Sanitation is all but non-existent in the camps, and running water is not available at all, even for the plumbing. One prisoner explained how prisoners would collect their own urine, which they would then use as water to soften their hardened stool, which they rubbed and pressed by hand. Then they would roll up their clothes and hammer the softened stool down the drain, and after which would have to use the remaining urine to wash the stool off their hands. This would inevitably lead to rashes and infection, and many died from the unsanitary conditions. The lack of sanitation extended to field work as well, with one prisoner explaining how they were forced to take their own diarrhea and use it to fertilize the corn they grew. However, the guards insisted that they do so with their rice bowls, which they ate off of. They would only have ditch water with which to rinse their bowls in, and then at lunchtime would have to eat off that same bowl. Not that there's much food for prisoners to eat anyways. Prisoners are served three meals a day, but meals typically consist of around 150 corn kernels that are lightly salted. Prisoners will then supplement their diets any way possible, and one prisoner recalled how despite the unsanitary conditions, there were no rats or insects to be found inside the prison because the prisoners ate them all. Dragonflies, butterflies, and pretty much anything that flew into the camp was caught and eaten, with pregnant rats being a delicacy because of the fetuses the rats carried inside it. Sometimes prisoners will light small fires with which to cook their caught rats or lizards, but if caught, they could be severely beaten by the guards. Therefore, most prisoners simply ripped their meals apart with their own hands and let the meat dry, then ate it raw. The forced labor in a camp typically consists of a 16-hour workday, matched by a quota that each prisoner was expected to achieve. This could be anything from pull X amount of weeds or mine X amount of coal, and if quotas were not met, then prisoners would forego food. Without food, prisoners would grow weaker, and thus new quotas would be even harder to achieve. Eventually, prisoners would simply starve to death. For prisoners, labor starts as young as elementary school age, and children to send into the mines or harvest lumber are in no short supply, thanks to the three generations rule. While on the job, injuries are common with medical treatment completely non-existent. If you weren't cured by a folk remedy, then you would likely die, and injuries were no excuse for slacking off. Quotas would not change depending on your health, and thus starvation also adds to the cause of death for injured workers. After 16 or more hours of hard labor, prisoners can expect two hours of recreational time, during which their recreation consists of memorizing and reciting the camp's rules and regulations. If a single prisoner makes a mistake or fails to memorize the rules, his or hers entire section is forced to start from scratch and continue until everyone can recite the rules perfectly. This cuts into sleep time, and with labor starting as early as 5 am, sleep is a precious commodity. Yet one prisoner who fled to the south explained how nighttime was the worst time of all. Prisoners were stuffed into small cells, 20 apiece, and sometimes you didn't have enough room to stretch your legs. Men and women were separated, though mothers were allowed to nurse babies. Prisoners would wail in pain as their bodies broke down from starvation, and women could be heard screaming, as nighttime was when the guards would come to round up women to be raped. Not just women though, children would also be rounded up for rape and torture, all as part of entertainment for the prison officials. Pregnancies were sometimes brought to term, with the baby growing up a prisoner, but often pregnant women or girls were simply beaten until they had a miscarriage. If prisoners misbehave or dare to rebel, they are severely punished, not just with beatings, which are routine, 
but with far worse punishments. One prisoner recalls how his camp had a special area for those being punished by the guards. This consisted of a specially tiny cell, where a prisoner could hardly move. The prisoner would be forced to sit in cold, muddy water for days or weeks at a time. If they survived the ordeal, prisoners would leave with their flesh rotting off their body. North Korea's labor camps are a blight on the face of humanity entering the 21st century. Hell holes of human rights abuses. They're a reminder that despite the gleaming societies of the glowing list of first world nations, there still exists medieval dictatorships built on foundations of pure evil. The Kim family is but one of many of humanity's most vile dynasties. But these chubby, overweight dictators are a true blight on a world that has worked hard to leave its barbaric roots behind. If you ask us, Kim Jong-un needs to choke on a cheeseburger and leave this world behind already. As of the writing of this episode, rumors abound from the Hermit Kingdom of North Korea, indicating that its supreme leader Kim Jong-un may have suffered a serious health event. Some even claim that the dear leader is in fact dead. News that has sent the intelligence agencies of every western nation as well as those of Japan and South Korea in a mad scramble to discover the truth. As of this episode writing, Japanese media outlets have reported that the North Korean leader is in a vegetative state, though the rumors have yet to be substantiated. Careful observation of North Korean military forces and communication patterns seem to indicate that there is nothing out of the ordinary going on in the secret kingdom. But it's impossible to say for certain yet what's really happening north of the demilitarized zone. But what if Kim Jong-un, supreme leader of North Korea, chairman of the Workers' Party, and supreme commander of the armed forces really did die? What would that mean for North Korea, and what would it mean for the rest of the world? The question of North Korea's succession has always been a tricky one. Kim Il-sung, the founder and the first supreme leader of North Korea, understood that governments underwent their greatest reformations during power transitions, and thus labored to create a monarchic communist system that would ensure little if any change took place after his death. In a traditional communist state, the party secretary general is elected by the National People's Committee, which is itself made up of members elected into office by the various districts that they represent. Needless to say, in North Korea there's not much voting of any sort, and certainly not from the average people. In North Korea, this Soviet-style process is completely circumvented. The National People's Committee is instead made up of appointments by the Supreme Leader himself based on loyalty of candidates, their merits, and recommendations from other senior and completely loyal party officials. In order to ensure the smooth transfer of power and their own continued survival, each Kim family member to take the throne has labored to fill the National Committee with loyalists who will not challenge their power or their choice of successor. However, having a clear successor in the first place is important, and Kim Jong-un lacks such a line of succession. When Kim Il-sung neared his death, he quickly began to groom his son Kim Jong-il to take power once he was gone. Kim Jong-il took on increasing government responsibility, giving him an air of legitimacy and competency long before his father actually died. As Kim Jong-il neared his own death, which was more sudden and unexpected than that of Kim Il-sung, he hastily appointed Kim Jong-un as his successor. The sudden appointment left many in doubt as to the future of the Kim dynasty in North Korea. At 28 years old, Kim Jong-un was not only young but inexperienced in leadership and the particular political intrigue of North Korea. He was quickly appointed to senior government and party positions including the powerful National Defense Commission and was granted the rank of a four-star general despite having no military experience. Senior party and military officials were immediately signed to him as mentors, and it quickly became clear to all that Kim Jong-il was planning for his young son to take over after his death. Despite all the preparation though, the initial transition period was fraught with uncertainties. Even with his grooming and training, many believed that Kim Jong-un was too young inexperienced and weak to lead, and most analysts suspected that ultimately while he may remain on the throne, other more powerful political elites within North Korea would be calling the shots. In effect, Kim Jong-un would become a figurehead and nothing more, with his puppet strings being pulled by those behind the scenes. It was believed that the vice chairman Jang song Thek would either outright take the throne or call the real shots in North Korea, or that the military would turn against the young Kim Jong-un and manipulate him under threat of death. Any number of his senior mentors were also believed to be in the running for ousting the new Kim, or simply becoming the shadow princes behind the throne. 
Much to the shock of everyone, none of those things happened, and instead Kim Jong-un proved just as ruthless as his predecessors in consolidating power. Most of his mentors, some of whom were suspected of outright trying to manipulate Kim, were killed or sent to prison camps, and a purge amongst the rest of the party elite removed any threats to Kim's power, going so far as to kill or imprison the men who had been faithfully loyal to his father for decades. Even Kim's own family members weren't safe. Kim Jong-nam, his brother-in-law, had no interest in political power, yet that did not save him from Kim Jong-un sending assassins to kill him while on a trip in Malaysia. While Kim Jong-nam might have had no aspirations for power, Kim Jong-un likely feared that the political elite within North Korea might use him as a figurehead to install on the throne after overthrowing Kim Jong-un. He likely also feared that Kim Jong-nam would be installed by South Korea and US forces after a war against the North. Kim Jong-un very quickly eliminated all his rivals and possible successors to his father's throne, cementing himself as the top leader in North Korea. In order to fend the powerful North Korean military off, the biggest threat to his power, Kim Jong-un also instituted a military-first policy that saw the military receive priority treatment from the new government. While successful, Kim Jong-un's transition to power had the benefit of two years of careful grooming by his father, and under a new succession would not. If the supreme leader died today, North Korea may look very different tomorrow. Kim Jong-un has no clear successor, and it's believed that in the case of his untimely death, it would be his sister, Kim Yo-jong, who would be granted power. This would be a dangerous proposition for the Kim dynasty though, since while Kim Yo-jong holds some position of political power in North Korea, the overwhelmingly patriarchal social structure of North Korea would likely see her regarded by many as an illegitimate ruler. Kim Yo-jong would have to be twice as ruthless as her brother if she wanted to retain the power, and yet in the end she might not be able to fend off a coup from within. While a member of the Kim family and a direct descendant of the original supreme leader to whom all Kim family members owe their legitimacy to, the fact that Kim Yo-jong is a woman would seriously weaken her claim to power. It's likely then that if Kim Yo-jong did retain leadership, she would serve as nothing more than a figurehead, exactly the fate that Kim Jong-un feared so much. However, she might very well be ousted completely and there are two major threats to her power. The first comes from Choi Yong-hae, who is currently the country's number two man a ruthless political elite with decades of experience and a direct link to Kim Jong-il as his trusted confidant. Not only does Choi Young-hae have a great deal of legitimacy as a political leader, his personal relationship with Kim Jong-un gives him some legitimacy with the Kim dynasty himself, and it's unlikely that the entire concept of a Kim dynasty would be trashed overnight. The hero worship of Kim Il-sung is simply too deeply entrenched in North Korean culture for that. Having Choi Young-hae step in as leader would likely be seen as acceptable to the North Korean people, especially if it was a quote, temporary measure, end quote, until a true Kim successor could be named. In that case, Kim Yo-jong would likely be left in a position of power, though it would be Choi Young-hae who called all the shots. Kim Yo-jong's only role would be to serve as a link to the Kim dynasty, though inevitably she might suffer a terrible accident. After all, if Choi Young-hae is only acting as a regent until a worthy Kim successor can be found, then one of her sons could eventually take power for himself away from Choi Young-hae. Along with Kim Yo-jong, a large number of Kim family members would likely meet with similar accidents. A second threat to Kim Yo-jong's throne would come from the military itself, the single most powerful apparatus within the nation. While Kim Jong-un's military first policy was meant to earn him the loyalty of the military, and it did, it has also served to cement its power in North Korean politics, and no successor to the Kim dynasty could take the role of supreme leader without their support. Whether an actual Kim family member or an outsider, the military could not only seize power in the event of Kim Jong-un's sudden death, it's very well positioned to do so. Not only is it the largest martial force in North Korea, its members also have deep ties to the national security agencies of the nation. No leader will take the North Korean throne without their approval. The most important thing though is if a successor comes from within the Kim family or not, as that will dictate how North Korea interacts with the rest of the world. While a Kim family member could over time change North Korea's relationship with the world, it would be an extremely slow and protracted process. Currently, the nation is ostracized by the world and economically sanctioned over its nuclear program and small stockpile of nuclear weapons. The international bloc standing against North Korea is led by the United States, which has made it clear it will not entertain any negotiations that don't include nuclear disarmament. This, however, is a problem for a Kim family member, 
as nuclear weapons are deeply tied to the legacy of the Kim dynasty. Kim Jong-un himself depended on the success of the nation's nuclear program, and had it failed to produce a working nuclear weapon, it's widely believed he would have been forcibly removed from power. In many ways, his continued hold on power is still dependent on nuclear weapons, and any abandonment of the North's nuclear program would be seen as treason against both Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il, as well as deeply anger the powerful military. If a new Kim family member were to take power, abandonment of the nuclear program would be tantamount to suicide. In a sense, a new Kim ruler has their hands tied at the international negotiation table with regard to nuclear disarmament. And for now, the issue of North Korean nuke development is a moot one. National policy will likely never change as long as a Kim rules. However, an outsider such as Choi Young hae could afford to institute major reforms if he wanted to. That is, of course, if he could find a way to keep the military from immediately removing him if he threatened to disarm their nuclear weapons. The prospects of having sanctions lifted and the massive economic benefit and international aid that would come as a result could be very appealing to many party officials though, and even some senior military leaders. It would certainly be so for the average North Korean citizen, who could see their lifestyle radically change thanks to an influx of foreign aid and investment as the Hermit Kingdom rejoins the world. Certainly, the prosperity of South Korea is a powerful lure to a possible successor to Kim Jong-un. And even if the military did not support nuclear disarmament and other major reforms, the citizens who would at last receive international aid and economic revival could make it very difficult for the military to replace a reformist leader. Whatever happens in North Korea's future, it's clear that the only real chance for change is if a non-Kim family member were to take power. Some people go to the Caribbean or Europe to enjoy a relaxing holiday. Others choose North Korea. Little did Otto Warmbier know that less than two years later he would be leaving the country in a vegetative state. It was supposed to be a fun, budget tour of the country, but one day Otto went too far. He didn't get blackout drunk or punch a military officer, he did something arguably even worse, stole a propaganda poster, at least so the allegation goes. When the powers that be found out, he'd be sentenced to 15 years of hard labor in North Korea's prison system, a reasonable sentence for such a treacherous crime. Yet it didn't take long for Otto to be so worn down that he'd be carried into a plane on a stretcher, boasting deformed limbs, serious brain damage, and incapable of eating. What about North Korea's prison system could be so harsh that it would break this prom king and bright college student in a matter of months? Let's rewind to the start of this ultimate fall from grace. Otto was in the Pyongyang airport ready to leave the country when officials pulled him aside after seeing his passport. A tour buddy made a joke that it'd be the last time they'd see each other again. Little did he know that his words would be true. The good news is that foreign prisoners in North Korea have special treatment compared to locals who are arrested. The government sees the value of foreigners as human bargaining chips who can play a part in easing the punitive sanctions the country faces. But there's bad news too. Less awful is still awful. First, foreign prisoners go to a guest house, or if they're lucky, a budget hotel, while they await trial. It's basically still a prison since they can't leave and are watched constantly by North Korean secret police, but that's preferable to a labor camp. While there, they're hardly left alone to mope around all day. Detainees can expect to face interrogation for up to 15 hours a day for weeks on end. It's all part of the process to wear prisoners down psychologically and manipulate them into confessing they're guilty of whatever they've been accused of. The interrogators have zero interest in discovering accurate information or figuring out what really happened. They already know what your story is, they just want to make sure that you know it too. If you want to keep both your life and your sanity, it's best to just go along with it and confess everything, all ready for a false confession during your so-called trial. North Korea appoints some prisoners their own lawyers to go through the motions, but those legal professionals serve the function of scolding the detainees rather than protecting them. Expect accusations of insulting the Kim dynasty or conspiring against the state, rather than discussions about what's happened and whether you're guilty. The purpose of the exercise is most likely to trick the accused into confessing for their sins. But we have to give credit where credit is due. Most past North Korean prisoners have admitted that the country treated them reasonably well. Foreign prisoners may receive beatings when they're first captured, but as soon as their nationality is established, the state doesn't lay a hand on them. Ultimately, North Korea accepts that they will someday have to send their prisoners back to their home countries, and they want the world to know how benevolent and reliable they are. So if this is what we call special treatment of foreigners, you might be wondering what exactly the locals have to go through. In two words, beatings and torture. Locals are treated like animals for having the audacity to defy the state they grew up in. Firstly, they're placed in rooms that often have nothing other than a mold-covered toilet and sink, not even a bed. 
their rounds of interrogation are far more likely to get physical and they're forced to cooperate without even a fake lawyer. In terms of food, they can expect delicious delicacies like rice mixed with dirt and gravel. Yummy. Once a week, they might get the chance to wash themselves using a bucket of hot water. There's no form of entertainment other than sitting and thinking. Occasionally, inmates might be allowed luxuries such as pencils and paper, or even better, biographies of Kim Jong-il and his father. There's nothing like learning about the inner life of your oppressor to distract you from your oppression. Psychological torture, however, is in the cards for everyone, North Koreans and foreigners alike. North Korea likes its prisoners to remain feeling isolated and hopeless so they can be more easily controlled and manipulated. Inmates have no contact with the outside world, and the foreigners are told their countries are doing nothing to try to rescue them. Even if negotiations to release prisoners are actually coming close to a conclusion, the prisoners have no idea until the moment they're about to be released. So if you ever go to North Korea and face arrest, don't believe a word they tell you. It's unlikely that local prisoners get any kind of meaningful trial, but foreigners at least get to pretend they do. Delegates from their home country are present, although they have little power over the verdict. The whole process is extremely short. Judges make their decisions almost instantly about what will happen based on the <coughs> false <coughs> confessions of the accused. A life sentence in a labor camp is pretty standard, but if you're unlucky, you could face the death penalty. Otto received a sentence for 15 years of hard labor during his trial. He appeared on the screen in a news conference confession where he broke down sobbing on camera and said that stealing the poster was the greatest mistake of his life. That would be the last time that most people would see him still capable of standing up and talking. Finally, Otto was taken to prison. There are currently around 150,000 to 200,000 people detained in North Korean prisons, or maybe even more. Amongst them are a few foreign nationals, mostly South Koreans. Inmates can expect to work on projects like coal mining while facing debilitating conditions and surviving on starvation rations. As before, foreigners get things slightly easier since their deaths would be bad press. So what on earth did happen in these prisons? How did Otto obtain this inexplicable brain damage? As an American, he was probably taken to a special labor camp exclusively for foreigners. Labor activities there include planting soybeans, making bricks, and shoveling coal. Cells consist of a bed, a toilet, and a little else. And what about the locals? You're going to wish you never even asked. North Koreans, who often face decade-long sentences for offenses as innocent as watching banned soap operas from South Korea or digging for edible plants, have a real tough time behind bars. Sometimes three generations of family will be in prison just to punish one person. The political prisons, also known as Kwanliso, are the worst. Most are precincts protected with electric fencing barbed wire, and even guard towers. Detainees are forced to dig their own graves while guards taunt them, raped as punishment for bad behavior, and tortured for not working hard enough. Sometimes prisoners disappear entirely. Newborns of prisoners have been fed to dogs. Amongst the numbers include thousands of child prisoners, many of whom are starved and overworked to death. Even for the soft foreign prisoners, life in a labor camp is harsh. Inmates are held in stinky, unkempt buildings infested with mosquitoes, cockroaches, and insects. The dilapidated structures feature undrinkable tap water and broken lights. They're surrounded by guards, but completely isolated from any other prisoners. Wake-up time is at 6 a.m., when a loudspeaker rudely awakens the prisoner, alerting them that they should get dressed. As a bonus, they might also get screamed at by guards, who call them by their number rather than their name and tell them they'll be stuck behind bars forever. Breakfast is a meager portion of white bread and some water. Then it's off to work, from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., all alone, of course. Cameras and guards watch every move of the prisoners during their labor to make sure they don't make a single wrong move. For lunch and dinner, it's back to rice with gravel. But once a week, there's a real treat, a boiled egg. I guess the officials accepted that some form of protein might be necessary for non-stop hard labor. Sometimes prisoners also get their hands on potato or salted cabbage, because apparently cabbage is supposed to be something to look forward to now. The weirdest part of prison time is in the evening, or so-called cultural time. You might expect this involves learning about the wonderful culture of North Korea, maybe some music or art. Nope, prisoners are simply left alone with no stimuli, perhaps to dream up the culture in their head. Even foreign prisoners are offered minimal protection from the elements. Winter gets cold in North Korea, yet prisoners are expected to use their bare hands to dig through frosty ground and to wander around without proper shoes or warm clothing. And that's right, I've been only talking about the easy ride the foreigners had up until now. Nationals have things way worse. After waking up at 5 a.m. at the latest, the prisoners must carry out hard labor until 7 p.m. And you thought the 9 to 5 was bad. 
The only break is for one hour at lunch, which consists of a measly portion of salt and corn. Hardly the most filling meal at the best of times, never mind when you're performing 11 hours of grueling tasks. It's not surprising most people resort to eating mice, insects, frogs, and anything else they can find to protect themselves from malnutrition. When times got really desperate, they might even turn to corn left out for the animals or even beans stuck in animal dung, and I'll let that one sink in for a while. Even worse, the prisoners have to walk more than 12 miles just to reach their workplace, usually a field of some kind. If you thought the foreign prisoners had it bad for needing to dig using their bare hands, try plowing a field while carrying a cart like a horse expected to run instead of walking. Pregnant women are made to do particularly strenuous work, like going up and down hills to ensure they suffer miscarriages. Then again, they're the ones who have it lucky because it's not unheard of for newborn babies to be fed to the dogs while the mothers are made to watch. As the detainees work, North Korean officials hurl verbal abuse at them. Despite the desperate conditions, there's no room for error. Make a minor mistake or step out of line and you can expect to be subject to beatings or torture, or worse. Once a month, there are public executions for the most problematic prisoners. Sometimes they're killed by their fellow prisoners who are forced to throw rocks at bodies hung alive from scaffolds. In the evenings, there are meetings until late at night, meaning most prisoners never manage more than a few hours sleep. Not that they have a bed to sleep in anyway. Whoever you are, North Korean prisons are brutal, but most people don't end up in a vegetative state, at least not as far as we know. So what really happened to Otto, the American tourist? How did he end up with brain damage after his arrest? North Korean officials claim Otto suffered an unexpected reaction to a sleeping pill which caused a rare condition called botulism. But the US officials say the young man's injuries were from beatings and torture. What's the truth? Strangely, reports suggest that Otto never even made it to a labor camp or prison. Just one day after his trial and press conference, the staff at the hotel detaining Otto reported he became unresponsive. He had to be resuscitated, given oxygen, and put on a ventilator to save his life. At that point, he most likely went directly to the place he was cared for until his return to the US. If this is true, the cause of his condition becomes even more mysterious. How could Otto be completely normal one day, yet fall prey to a fatal condition before he even faced the horrendous North Korean prison conditions? Once Otto reached the hospital, it seems healthcare professionals cared for him extremely well. US officials admitted he'd probably received around-the-clock care noting an impressive lack of bed sores for someone in a vegetative state. You've gotta give it to North Korea, even if the motivation was covering their own asses. Unfortunately, it was not enough to save Otto's life. Shortly after he returned to the US, he passed away. Nobody really knows what happened while the young man was detained, and it's unlikely we ever will. Two possibilities are an allergic reaction or a suicide attempt provoked by psychological torture. The year was 2004 and a container ship called the Ever Unique made its last stop at the port of Newark in the US after leaving from China. On this particular day, FBI and Secret Service agents were laying in wait, believing that some containers on the ship might be carrying something of interest. They were right, but what they'd find was more than they'd bargained for. Under boxes filled with an array of plastic toys, they discovered secret compartments that contained hard cash, except the money was only $100 bills. The notes they beheld were flawless, faultless, and to anyone but an expert gifted with the right technology, these notes were just as good as the real thing. But they weren't the real thing, they were counterfeits. Almost perfect counterfeits. Where'd they come from? Who had invested the time and money to create such flawless notes? The authorities understood immediately that to make such consummate currency, you'd need very advanced technology. These were obviously by no means your run-of-the-mill counterfeit notes. The experts who looked at them couldn't believe their eyes. This was a huge problem. The US dollar, being what we call the world's currency, is very, very difficult to recreate perfectly, but someone had done it. When the authorities took these bills to forensic analysts, what those analysts saw before them was a perfect composition of fibers used in real bills. They even commented that the engravings were possibly of a better quality than those created by the United States Bureau of Engraving and Printing. The fakes were in one sense even better than the real thing. They came up with a new name for these bills, and that was the Supernote. Almost perfect imitation that would fool just about anyone, from the man in the street to the teller at the bank. Hell, if you could create enough of these things, you could spend until your heart's content and have little fear about getting caught. Since the discovery of the first super $100 bills, millions more have been found on container ships with loads destined for the US. But who is making these super notes? Following the discovery, investigators in the US started a series of operations such as Royal Charm and Smoking Dragon, at first thinking the counterfeits were being made by powerful gangs originating in Asia. Unlike many organized crime outfits that traffic drugs and guns in the West, Asian gangs tend to work quietly 
and share a high degree of sophistication. But when the investigation started paying off and links to these gangs were arrested on American soil, the authorities shocked the world. They said that it wasn't the networks of organized crime that were actually making the fake money, it was the government of North Korea. The gangs, they merely spread the money around. In no time at all, North Korea denied the accusation, but the US said the evidence they had was more than sufficient. North Korea was a money-making machine, they said, and technologies the country used were second to none. What ensued was a bank in Macau called Banco Delta Asia being shut down, and with it the accounts of some of North Korea's ruling elite. The bank was accused of taking counterfeit cash and then laundering it in the world of real money. This shady kind of business was all run through something called Room 39. North Korea's Department of Dark Money. Or at least that's where all of the evidence pointed to or what evidence was available. Was this such a big deal at the time? Seeing as the world was watching in fear as their TVs told them that the secret nation was hellbent on creating weapons that could bring us all down? The answer is yes, it was a really big deal, with some US officials calling it an act of war. You see, when counterfeiters are merely street-level hustlers doing a bad job recreating cash, or even organized crime giving it a shot, it's not seen as such a large threat. People have been counterfeiting cash for many years, since the time when you could have been hanged, drawn, and quartered for trying to fake the king's coinage. But one state doing it against another? That could be said to be a hostile act under international laws. The US came right out and said that by counterfeiting another country's currency, you are in no uncertain terms a threat to the American people. As we said, the branch of the North Korean government responsible for such criminal enterprises is known as Room 39 or Office 39 or Bureau 39, it's all the same thing. How do we know this entity exists since North Korea isn't exactly giving tours to US officials and investigators and showing them exactly how things are run? The answer is high-ranking North Korean defectors. Some of these folks have come out and said the most unbelievable things. Word on the street is that Room 38 deals with the cash made by Room 39. Room 35, though, that's in a league of its own. That's the office that focuses on assassinations and kidnappings. There are also reports that Room 39 is behind the production of illegal drugs on an industrial scale. We're talking meth labs that would impress the fictional Walter White. The drugs can be made in North Korea under the eye of the government and then sold around the world for those American dollars the country likes so much. Since North Korea can't really make money on the international market due to sanctions, one way to make dollars is to go through the black market. Room 39, if you like, is the black market HQ for North Korea. While many folks seem to believe the majority of the world's narcotics come from South America and through Mexico, what's often underlooked and perhaps not Netflixable enough is the fact that many of the world's drugs are actually coming out of Asia. All kinds of drugs can be made in countries such as North Korea or in parts of Myanmar, and then, through Asian gangs, shipped around the world. Methamphetamine labs have been a great source of income for North Korea during harsh international sanctions. But ICE isn't the only order of the day. It's reported that the country also has many poppy fields and has for a long time. The raw opium is then turned into heroin, and that heroin finds its way into Asian countries and subsequently to North America and Europe. If the country wasn't so closed off, we might have seen a Narcos North Korea show. Experts writing about the country tell us that the meth production began not as a money spinner, but as a way to keep North Korean soldiers alert and awake. No surprise there, there isn't a military in the world that hasn't given its troops some kind of speed at one time or another. In the 90s, the country hit a wall when there was a very bad opium crop harvest, and North Korea saw dope profits fall drastically. Officials who were hit hard by this put their heads together and said, why not start using state facilities and start making methamphetamine and trafficking it abroad? Meth isn't ever prey to a bad harvest, and the officials agreed to knock up some labs under state-owned companies and then get in touch with various Asian criminal networks in China, Myanmar, and Thailand. Think about it, if North Korea can produce the best banknotes that forensic analysts have ever seen, what kind of meth could the country make? Perhaps Kim Jong-un and his cronies are breaking bad on a scale that would literally blow our minds. But North Korea isn't immune to its own drug problems. One expert said recently that the government has cracked down on meth production since the country now faces a meth epidemic. It isn't that the government was selling it to its own people, but that some North Korean citizens created their own labs. Private enterprises were creating the meth and then paying bribes to state officials so they could keep producing. Those officials were paying other officials and in the end everyone turned a blind eye and got paid. 
If the bribe wasn't paid, as happened in 2019 when a woman was given a prison sentence of 10 to 15 years, you went straight to jail. The Dongju, which means the elites or masters of money, will get paid by these private drug dealers and traffickers. If there's a crackdown, according to some sources in North Korea, any Dongju doing deals with the public will be notified before the bust. If that sounds confusing to you, what some inside media tells us is that the government isn't happy about the average citizen getting in on the drugs business, and so they are being taken out. However, if they are connected and pay their way in bribes, officials are happy to look the other way. So who pushes North Korea's dope? The answer might surprise you. Scores of trade officials and North Korean diplomats have been arrested for trying to sell NK-made medicinal amphetamines and benzodiazepines worth millions of dollars abroad. This kind of thing goes back many years, and each time the North Korean government has said, the diplomats went rogue, and they weren't giving the profits back to the powers that be. No one really believed this, of course. One defector said in 2018 that Room 39 was about one thing and one thing only, and that is to supply the great leader of the country and his cronies with money. He called the money raised a revolutionary fund. He said that some of the exports controlled by this room are in fact legal, but of the $639 million to $2.5 billion made each year, a lot of the income is from illicit activities. This has been called a royal slush fund, and if you don't know what a slush fund is, it's what you might call dark money earned by corrupt means. He said he worked for the Kumgang Trading Company which dealt in gold, gemstones, and ginseng. Because there are sanctions on North Korea, part of his job was to smuggle the products across the border into China, and from there it would reach the international market. And that's hardly the crime of the century, but defectors have also said another product being smuggled out of the country is weapons. Those weapons might make their way to organized crime or countries devastated by internal conflict. North Korean weapons have ended up in countries in Africa, South America, and the Middle East. And there's another type of crime North Korea engages in that might surprise you. Insurance fraud hasn't been talked about very much in the media. North Korea's Room 39 is said to have raked in hundreds of millions of dollars from international companies working as reinsurers, which means offering protection for insurance companies. North Korea has denied it, but investigators have said the country has made fraudulent claims on a helicopter crash, two train crashes, and a ferry sinking. Other dubious claims have been related to crop failures, mining accidents, fires, and floods. The state-owned Korea National Insurance Corporation will initially take the risk, but then that's passed on to international reinsurers from various countries in the world. Reinsurers in Europe, India, and Egypt were all involved in the payout for that helicopter crash, which some investigators say was staged. An expert who spoke some years after the crash said one lesson had been learned, and that was, never agree to have disputes decided in a North Korean court, and never reinsure KNIC. So if the North Korean people are starving, where does all the money go? Well, a lot of the cash coming out of Room 39 goes toward the military and the country's nuclear program. Most of it fills the pockets of the country's leaders, and very little goes to the people who need it most, North Korea's citizens. A lot goes to the super rich of North Korea. Like when the Italian government blocked the sale of two luxury yachts to North Korea in 2009. Room 39 was behind the purchase, and the boats were worth more than $15 million. Reports have also surfaced that through this office, North Korea has illegally imported hundreds of luxury cars, vans, and other vehicles. As a report stated in 2010, criminal proceeds are distributed to members of the North Korean elite, including senior officers of the armed forces, and are used to support Kim Jong-il's personal lifestyle and are invested in its military apparatus. But for a country most considered technologically backwards, North Korea has another criminal surprise waiting for you. Reports in 2019 stated that North Korea's hackers stole around $2 billion from banks and cryptocurrency exchanges in 17 different countries. Hacking might have become the country's newest and most profitable way of making money, and all without the risk of being stopped by customs officials and having their product confiscated. By now, it's sure that North Korea has made far more than the $2 billion originally stated making hacking extremely lucrative for North Korean cyber whizzes. What'll come out of Room 39 next, we do not know. But we expect more nefarious cyber activity to be in the cards. North Korea has tried a lot of things, including the illegal export of fake Marlboro cigarettes and its very own version of Viagra, but it's likely that the hacking game will be the way ahead as long as there are sanctions on the country. As for the meth and the opiates, there will always be a market for that as long as North Korea can keep getting it through the large border with China. As one defector put it, the only way to earn hard currency is by drugs. But time has proven him wrong, and now North Korea's criminal enterprise exists in both the real and cyber world. Still, don't be surprised if some of the drugs on the streets in the USA and elsewhere start coming with the label proudly made in North Korea. Trees fly by as the old Jeep barrels down the highway on November 13, 2017. 
It's 3.11 p.m., and 24-year-old North Korean soldier Oh Chung Song grips the steering wheel with slick palms. He glances over his shoulder to glimpse the empty road behind him. Thankfully, no other vehicles are chasing him, yet. His heart pounds wildly as he struggles to keep the jeep from fishtailing. He's challenged fate by fleeing. He has to make it, or he'll die, either immediately by firing squad or they'll send him to a concentration camp where he'll slowly waste away. Up ahead, a split in the road. O turns the steering wheel, veering left. Wrong choice. Up ahead is a guard post. He jams the accelerator to the floor, trying to make the jeep go faster. The engine shrieks and the jeep rattles like it's on the verge of falling apart. He hunkers down in the driver's seat, bracing for impact. The soldiers at the checkpoint race out to meet him, shouting for him to stop. Thankfully, the jeep easily blows past the barrier, blasting the wood to pieces. The soldiers chase after him, but the jeep is already out of reach. Panting, O focuses on the road ahead. He's close now. The jeep is almost at the 72-hour bridge. Luckily, the bridge is easily crossed. He heads into a straightaway leading to the joint security area. O has to ease off the gas as he veers past the monument of signature and makes a right turn around the corner. Up ahead, the road ends in a wooded area. Beyond that is freedom. O drives off the road, the jeep immediately crashing into a drainage ditch. He stomps on the pedal, trying to move the vehicle forward, but it's stuck. Meanwhile, soldiers are bounding down the steps of the Panmugang Pavilion, sprinting down the street, guns at the ready rushing after him. O twists the steering wheel, rocking the jeep, but it's stuck fast. The soldiers are only yards away by now. O scrambles out of the jeep, leaves crunching underfoot. He's only taken a few steps when he hears a pop and excruciating pain burns through his shoulder. But he lumbers forward anyway, pushing through the pain to cross the DMZ. The soldiers fire a hail of bullets after him. O finally collapses in a pile of leaves near a low perimeter wall of South Korea's Freedom House complex. The JSA security battalion has been watching O's dramatic escape on CCTV. They continue watching as DPRK soldiers violate the armistice by firing guns into South Korea and briefly crossing the DML. The soldiers gather near the Monument of Signature, trying to decide what to do about the defector. Deputy Commander Kwon Young Hwan and another South Korean soldier crawl along the ground, carefully inching toward O, very aware that they were in range of a DPRK guard tower. Finally, they reach him at about 3.43 p.m., nearly half an hour after he'd been shot. They gently drag the wounded unconscious soldier to a safer area and load him onto a vehicle. O is quickly transported to a helipad where a U.S. medic team puts him on a stretcher and starts life-saving treatment. Soon after, a medevac team arrives on an American Black Hawk helicopter. The pilots push the helicopter to the max and make the 30-minute flight to Aujo University Hospital in Suwon in 22 minutes. O is rushed into surgery, and he's been hit six times in the stomach, right side of the pelvis, both arms, and both legs. During a five-and-a-half-hour operation, doctors repair O's perforated bowel. He's lost more than half of his blood. Also during surgery, doctors find more than 52 intestinal worms in O's gut. On top of that, he's malnourished, has hepatitis B and tuberculosis, all signs of living in an impoverished country with little health care. O eventually recovers after multiple surgeries, 12 days in the ICU, and over five weeks in the hospital. For the first several days of his recovery, South Korean special forces guard O in the hospital because the government's worried that North Korea would try to assassinate him as a warning to other would-be defectors. In later interviews, O claims that when he woke up on the morning of November 17th, he hadn't planned to defect from North Korea. Crazy enough, it was a spur-of-the-moment idea. Since 2000, some 33,000 North Koreans have defected to South Korea. Very few defectors flee via the DMZ, the 160-mile-long stretch of heavily militarized border separating the two Koreas. Most flee to China and make their way through Laos and Vietnam to refugee-friendly Thailand, which will grant them asylum and fly them to South Korea. Once in South Korea, North Korean defectors are granted citizenship. In recent years, Kim Jong-un has tightened security along the DPRK-China border. Also, China considers North Korea defectors illegal economic migrants and under a border agreement deports them back to the DPRK, where they're executed or harshly punished in prison camps. Chinese citizens who aid defectors face steep fines and imprisonment. As a result, the cost to use an escape broker who arranges transportation and shelter for defectors has greatly risen. Currently, using a broker can cost around $18,000, about five times the cost from a few years ago. However, there are some activist and religious groups that also transport escapees through underground networks. In recent years, alternative defection routes through Russia and Mongolia have also become popular. Here's another tale of a crazy escape from North Korea. 
On the night of February 7, 2017, 26-year-old Park Hyun Woo and his father left their home in the North Hamgyong province of North Korea, separately as not to arouse suspicion. They met up later that night near the semi-frozen Tumen River, which serves as a border between North Korea and China. The two of them had a comfortable life by North Korean standards. They both worked for the railway. Many years before, Park's two sisters had defected to South Korea and regularly sent them money through a secret network. However, father and son were frequently being hassled by local authorities for having defectors in the family. They took with them a smartphone memory card. It contained pictures taken of printed photographs they had to leave behind. They left the rest of their possessions behind in their house so as not to arise suspicion that they were escaping. The only other thing they each carried was a small pellet of rat poison wrapped in plastic in their mouths in case they were discovered. Father and son waded through icy water to cross the two men. It was a miserable walk. Their wet clothing started to freeze. On the Chinese side of the river, they met up with one of Park's sisters. The three of them crawled under a fence and took a waiting van to a safe house. At the house, Park and his father burned their clothes and buried their North Korean leader's lapel pins. Three days later, Park and his father, along with some other escapees, caught a train from Yanji to Shenyang. The group arrived safely, and the Parks split off to meet up with a pastor who took them on another train to Jinzu. They stayed in Jinzu at the pastor's home for several days and experienced many firsts, including their first hot showers. After saying goodbye to the pastor, Park and his father took a train to Beijing with some other defectors. Then they boarded their first in a series of six buses. They were headed to Kunming, their last destination in China. Their final bus pulled into a dimly lit gas station near the outskirts of Kunming around midnight on February 19th. Something felt off. Park and his father had made a pact that if things went wrong, he would run and leave his father behind. So he fled. His intuition was correct. Chinese police were about to raid the bus. The police chased after Park. He tried a dangerous yet clever move to escape. He sprinted onto an expressway and had to dodge speeding trucks. The police turned back, deciding not to take the risk. Terrified and disoriented, Park wandered the area, eventually hiding in a graveyard in the mountains. Chinese Lunar New Year had just passed, and Park survived by eating the food offerings left by visitors on the graves. When he ran out of food, he finally went to the nearest village, bought fruit, and was able to get a phone signal. He got in touch with his handlers, who sent a car to take him to a safe house in Kunming. In Kunming, Park met with the other defectors, and they trekked through dense, mountainous rainforest in the Laos. Park ended up carrying an exhausted elderly woman who said that she couldn't go any further and wanted to be left behind. Once in Laos, the refugees took a half-day's car ride to the Mekong River, the final border before Thailand. Thankfully, they were able to safely cross the turbulent river on a wooden longboat. They surrendered themselves at a police station in Chiang Kong, Thailand. After staying in a detention center in Bangkok, on March 24th, Park flew to Seoul. It was his first ever airplane flight. He was sent to government facilities to be debriefed and learn how to navigate South Korea. Meanwhile, his sisters tried to find out what happened to their father. Park Sr. had managed to evade the police at the gas station but was arrested while trying to cross into Laos. He ended up in a Chinese prison in the Liaoning province. It was unclear if he'd be sent back to North Korea. The siblings lobbied the South Korean government, UN officials, anyone they could contact. In August of 2018, Park Sr. was finally released to South Korea. It had taken him one and a half years and a journey of over 5,000 miles to reach Seoul, South Korea, a destination just 400 miles from his home. Interestingly, while men, often soldiers, tend to make more dramatic escapes from North Korea frequently for political and ideological reasons, the majority of defectors are women. In the last 10 years, over 75% of North Korean defectors to South Korea were women. There are a few reasons why defectors skew female. Women are the breadwinners of the family and often bear the brunt of the financial hardships. A significant number of DPRK women have service sector jobs or don't have official posts so they pursue off-the-books employment such as selling smuggled goods. They also cross into China through established smuggling routes to live and work in the border region, sending money back home. Their defection may be temporary with them returning home. Also, unfortunately, female defectors are likely to get caught up in a human trafficking scheme. Korean NGOs estimate that 70 to 80 percent of North Korean women who make it to China are trafficked for between 6,000 and 30,000 yuan, depending on their age and beauty. Lee Yumi grew up in a family of low-level party members. She had plenty to eat, but her parents were extremely strict and wouldn't allow her to follow her dream of studying medicine. One day after a fight with them, she decided to leave the DPRK. Lee found a broker to help her make the journey. He promised her work in a restaurant in China, but that was a lie. 
One night, Lee crossed the chilly Tumen River with seven other girls. Once they reached the city of Tumen, which sits on the river, Lee and the other girls were transported to Yanji, a city in Jilin province about 30 miles from Tumen. In Yanji, Lee was taken to an apartment on the fourth floor of a large building. There, her broker sold her for 30,000 yuan to the operator of a cybersex chat room. Two other North Korean women were also imprisoned there. Lee bonded with 19-year-old Kwang Ha-yoon, who had already been locked up for two years when Lee arrived. The women had to log on to an online chat platform on which South Korean men can pay to watch girls perform sexual acts via webcam. If they refused, their boss would beat them. Lee spent upwards of 12 hours a day interacting with men on the site. The apartment front door was always locked from the outside and there was no handle on the inside. The boss would allow the women outside every six months, taking them to a small nearby park. In 2015, Lee tried to escape by climbing out of the window and down a metal drain, but she fell and hurt her back and her leg. She still has a slight permanent limp. One of her customers realized that she was North Korean from her accent and guessed that she was probably being held captive. The customer let Lee control his laptop remotely so she could send messages without her boss noticing. He also gave her the phone number of a South Korean pastor named Chun Ki Wong. Pastor Chun runs a Christian aid organization, Durihana, which has helped over 1,000 defectors reach Seoul since 1999. In September 2018, Lee contacted Pastor Chun on a Korean messaging service. Over several weeks of secret chats, they hatched a plan for Lee and Kwang's escape. On October 26th, while Lee's boss was out, an extraction team from Durihana arrived at the foot of the building. The girls tied their bedsheets together and dropped them out of the window. The team then tied a rope to the sheets, which the girls hauled up and then used to lower themselves safely to the ground. They jumped into a car and sped away. The whole operation was completed in just minutes. Lee and Kwong traveled from one safe house to another across China on buses and trains using fake Korean passports. Their last stop was Kunming. From there, they spent several hours hiking through the mountains and then walking through the jungle to cross into a neighboring country. For safety, Durihana didn't reveal to the media which country the girls went to. Near the end of their travels, they met up with Pastor Chun. For the next two days, he escorted them by car and bus to the capital city. He left the girls at the South Korean embassy. They were debriefed for 10 days and then taken to South Korea. Both girls were looking forward to going to school and beginning new lives. Huang had spent nearly eight years in slavery while Lee had spent six. During the Cold War, the Soviet Union was North Korea's lifeline, providing weapons, supplies, training, and even some limited military assistance to the North Korean government. While US and Soviet troops never clashed on the ground on the Korean peninsula, Soviet fighters provided some limited cover over certain parts of North Korea, though refused North Korea's requests to fly frontline combat support against American jets. Without the Soviet Union, North Korea would have fallen to the south, and today the Hermit Kingdom and the Kim family would not exist a very obvious win for all of humanity. Today, Russia engages in only minor trade with the internationally shunned kingdom and no longer directly finances or supports it. With North Korea owing its existence to the old Soviet Union though, could North Korea repay that favor by teaming up with modern Russia against its greatest international rival, the United States? Could North Korea and Russia team up to destroy the US? We've looked at a potential conflict between the US and Russia before and already determined that the Russian military is simply not capable of winning a war against the American military. The modern Russian military is made up of just over 1 million active duty personnel, with US forces numbering around 1.4 million. There isn't just a numbers disparity though, as there is also a training and morale disparity between the two militaries. Despite attempts to move to an all-volunteer force by the Russian military, it's still overwhelmingly made up of conscripts versus an all-volunteer military fielded by the US. Conscripts historically greatly underperform versus volunteer military forces and suffer both from morale and training issues, two things which would be of a grave concern to a Russia fighting an uphill war against a more technologically capable opponent. However, what if North Korea lent its forces to the fight? bolstering Russian numbers so that they dwarfed America's. With an active duty military of 1.3 million, Russian and North Korean forces combined would number at 2.3 million, outnumbering the US by 700,000, a significant advantage. 
Of course, in a real conflict, neither side could use its full military in a conflict against the other, as both sides in this hypothetical war would need to maintain its military presences in other strategically important areas. Russia would still need to secure its eastern border against NATO's counterattack upon declaring a war on the US, as NATO's charter states that an attack on one is an attack on all, automatically triggering a declaration of war by the entire alliance on the aggressor. Without the US's homeland and overseas forces stationed outside of Europe though, NATO would be unable to prosecute a war against Russia, as Europe's militaries are simply too weak to stand up to Russia in anything but a defensive war. To make matters worse, some countries such as Canada and Germany are experiencing serious logistical issues which leaves large parts of their forces combat ineffective. In 2019, the German Air Force was incapable of sustaining the type of air operations needed in a conflict against Russia due to a lack of equipment and maintenance issues with its planes. With Canada suffering a similar issue and a fighter shortage that left it unable to fulfill its commitments to North American aerospace defense. Still, with Russian forces elsewhere, NATO could pose serious problems for Russia, and thus Russia would need to retain a significant bulwark to deter against NATO aggression on its eastern front. North Korea also has strategic concerns that leave it unable to fully commit its forces to a fight against the US, as despite being the 25th most powerful military in the world, it faces South Korea directly across the DMZ, which it's currently ranked as the world's sixth most powerful military. The United States, perhaps though, has a worse strategic picture than either of these two nations, as its military forces are deployed around the world in a variety of strategic hotspots, and very often it's these military forces that ensure regional peace and stability. Its large commitment in the Middle East ensures that conflict does not arise between historical rivals, such as Iran and Saudi Arabia, which would have devastating consequences for the global economy. Iran's strategic goals in a potential conflict against Saudi Arabia or the US is to shut down the Persian Gulf oil trade, which thanks to the geography of the Gulf of Oman, it could easily do by threatening oil tankers with long-range standoff weapons that the US or any of its allies could do little about. Iranian special forces could even scuttle a tanker in the Suez Canal, yet another military objective of Iran in case of a war, which would choke off one of the world's most important trade arteries for weeks, possibly months. In the South Pacific, US forces help maintain the balance between China and its neighbors, with China being a particularly bad actor in the region and bullying or outright stealing territory and resources from nations like the Philippines, Vietnam, and others. China and Japan, longtime rivals, also rely on the US presence to maintain stable relationships, with the threat of American firepower backing up its Japanese allies, keeping China's behavior in check. Realistically, both sides could only count on perhaps half of their total military power in a conflict against the other. Though, in this regard, the US has an advantage as it has long operated its military under a doctrine that states it must be able to fight and defeat two near-peer adversaries simultaneously anywhere in the world. For this reason, the US maintains the world's largest sea and airborne mobility fleet, allowing it to quickly move forces around the world to any conflict, but also giving it the advantage of quickly replacing frontline forces in need of rest and recuperation with reserve forces stationed elsewhere on peacekeeping duties. This ability will ensure the integrity of the US frontline forces better than North Korea and Russia, who both have major shortfalls in mobility and will be forced to leave their frontline forces in theater for longer, wearing on morale, equipment, and unit integrity from casualties. Mobility is a major challenge for the Russian-North Korean alliance. North Korean mobility is all but nil, with only a token air or sea mobility force used to counter South Korean advances into its territory. Russia operates a far larger mobility command, though it is on its own barely enough to move Russian forces in significant quantities anywhere around the world and far short of what would be needed for a major offensive against a military power such as the US. With only 12 of its heaviest transport aircraft, the Antonov AN-124 in service, the only aircraft capable of moving heavy military equipment in significant quantities, Russia would be hard-pressed to quickly move critical tanks, air defense assets, and artillery to the North American continent for an invasion. Its fleet of 109 Ilyushin 276 aircraft could supplement that airlift capacity, but on their own these aircraft would only be able to move perhaps a platoon's worth of soldiers and their equipment and one main battle tank per flight. At sea, the Russian Navy doesn't fare much better, with a fleet of only about 20 landing ships with another two in reserve. 
Each of these ships could carry around 20 tanks and up to 425 troops, and even if Russia could muster its entire mobility fleet at once, which is not realistic as due to the maintenance and retrofit requirements, no navy on Earth ever has full use of all of its ships at one time, Russia could still move 440 tanks and perhaps two regiments of infantry per sortie. Even with no casualties amongst the landing ships and no equipment breakdowns through perhaps some miracle, it would take over six months to move the entire North Korean and Russian military to North America. Deciding on where to land in the US, though, would be vital for the Russian-North Korean alliance. And there are few good options. Even if we ignored the reality of NATO or South Korea, Australia, and Japan coming to the US's defense, and Russia could concentrate its forces for an assault on North America, it would still need to get through the teeth of the American Navy. An invasion of America would require months of preparation, moving naval and air assets to Russia's west coast which would afford the U.S. just as much time to prepare to counter such an invasion. With the U.S. concentrating its naval forces in the Pacific, the most direct route would be the best route, with Russian North Korean forces striking directly into Alaska to secure a foothold on North America. Anchorage would be the most ideal target for an invasion, as it holds a large deepwater port that would make it possible to quickly offload forces. An assault against any other part of the Alaskan coast would require the use of landing craft, something which is also in short supply in the Russian Navy. Invading Alaska poses several problems, as the Japanese found out in World War II. First, it's too far away from the American heartland to pose any serious economic or industrial risk to the U.S.'s warfighting effort. While oil-rich, the U.S. would easily be able to supplement its consumption via the Gulf of Mexico or even overseas sources, and the seizure of Alaskan oil fields would result in extremely minor economic harm to the U.S. economy. Still, with such limited mobility assets, Alaska would be the best bet for the alliance to gain a vitally important foothold in North America. Russian invasion craft, however, would face the full wrath of the world's largest submarine fleet in an environment that's keenly suited for submarine warfare thanks to the turbulent nature of the Bering Sea. Even in summertime, the Bering can be treacherous to cross, and winter operations for heavy military cargo craft would be all but impossible. Anti-submarine operations in the rough seas are an extremely dicey proposition, and while Russia does maintain a capable attack submarine fleet, it's dwarfed in size and capabilities by the American fleet. To make matters worse, Russia only operates a single aircraft carrier, and the nation severely lacks an aerial refueling craft. As if that wasn't bad enough, only a portion of the Russian Air Force is even capable of in-flight refueling, meaning that for the crossing across the Bering Sea, the invasion fleet would be largely without air cover. The US, on the other hand, has two major Air Force installations in Alaska, Eielsen and Elmendorf Air Force bases, and in the months leading up to the invasion would quickly expand their capacity to host the rest of the significantly large American Air Force by building extra runways, hangars, and maintenance facilities. Even without its use of its 11 aircraft carriers, of which realistically only perhaps five would be available for combat ops at any one time, the US Air Force would easily defend Alaska from invasion, and with a fleet of about 450 aerial tankers, the largest in the world, American jets would have the range to cover any possible invasion avenue. With 31 AWACS aircraft or Airborne Warning and Control System in its fleet, the US Air Force would be able to supplement its land-based radar coverage to detect Russian ships and air forces at great ranges. Russia, on the other hand, only operates about 15 to 19 AWACS systems, and despite their long range, the lack of air refueling capabilities in the Russian Air Forces would mean very limited sortie rates and loitering times both. In effect, a serious deficiency in airborne radar, aerial refueling, and military transport would make an invasion of Alaska completely impossible. The logistics simply don't exist for the Alliance to make such an attempt, and with major army bases in Alaska and fast rail and airborne transport capabilities by the US, even if Russian landing craft managed to make it through the teeth of the US Navy and Air Force both, they would be completely overwhelmed by American land forces and destroyed in a very short matter of time. An attempt could be made to to cross the North Pole's ice cap, though such an attempt would have to be done in winter, meaning horrible weather conditions which would wreak havoc on men and equipment both. Then there's also the problem of extended supply lines, and even with ad hoc airfields quickly built on the ice, an invasion force would still lack the air cover needed to be protected from the American Air Force. Even if, by some miracle, the Alliance managed to take Alaska, which, let's be clear, this is a complete strategic impossibility, the United States and its warfighting capability would be negligibly affected by the invasion. 
the alliance would have to push into the continental US to seriously damage its industrial and military capabilities to wage war, and that would mean pushing through Canada and adding yet another combatant to the fight, as Canada would under no circumstances allow such an invasion force to simply stroll through its territory. To make matters worse, the force would have to move through very difficult terrain which would heavily favor American and Canadian defenders, and as it moved further and further south it would face even greater numbers of American air forces. In Alaska, American air forces would be limited by the physical space available on the airfields to host them. But in the continental US, the widespread number of large civilian airports and military air bases means that the vast American air force would still be able to be brought down on the invasion force in full effect, while Russian forces would still only be able to operate a token number of aircraft from seized Alaskan and Canadian airfields, and only operate at limited ranges due to a lack of aerial refueling assets. North Korea would be able to give Russia the numbers needed to seriously challenge the United States, but in terms of technology and additional assets, it would offer very little to the alliance. If anything, the added burden of supplying and transporting North Korean troops might even seriously damage Russia's own capabilities. After all, there is little possibility that North Korea could actually maintain the supply requirements of its vast military past a few weeks. In the end, as we've seen before countless times in these scenarios, America's homeland could never be breached by an invading force due to the current lack of mobility and logistical support aircraft and ships amongst the world's navies. If any nation on Earth were to attempt it, they would need to heavily invest in building at least as large a mobility and logistical fleet as the US, because it doesn't matter how many guns you have, if you can't move them in significant numbers quickly enough, any invasion is bound to fail. The Korean War has never formally ended, and for North Korea there is only one acceptable outcome – reunification under North leadership. Alarmingly, despite South Korea being protected by the might of the US military, it might be able to achieve this. North Korea views reunification not just as a matter of national pride but of survival for the Kim regime. The situation in the North is bad, really bad with even Pyongyang experiencing food shortages in recent years. The COVID pandemic also put a lot of pressure on the Kim regime, and as the South continues to prosper while the North stagnates, reunification by force may be the regime's last chance to stave off an insurrection. Standing in the way of reunification by force are about 600,000 South Korea troops and 50,000 American troops. The South fields a largely modern and capable military and has the explicit backing of the United States of America. Together, the two are a military juggernaut that the North can't hope to beat. Or could it? Because North Korea has some plans to either break this alliance or simply win before the US can bring its full might to bear. With over a million troops, North Korean forces outnumber the ROK's own by 300,000. Their equipment is outdated and the bulk of their armored forces consist of Soviet-era T-62s. By comparison, the South fields the mighty K-2 battle tank, a fully modern and extremely capable system. North Korea's air force is antiquated and largely a token force, and its navy has a little bit of a punch, but is outclassed by the South. But the North has one thing going for it, a massive concentration of artillery that the South can't counter. Artillery has become the saving grace of failed militaries around the world, and nowhere is this better displayed than in Ukraine. After Russia failed at combined arms operations, its best tanks were eviscerated by American and British anti-tank missiles, and its air force failed to suppress Ukrainian ground forces. It went back to the type of fighting it knew best, indiscriminate and overwhelming firepower via artillery. With as much as a 20 to 1 advantage over Ukraine, Russian artillery has been able to grind the war to a slow, steady grind and prevent an embarrassing all-out rout. North Korea's artillery may be old, but the beauty of artillery is that it doesn't have to be very modern to be extremely lethal, especially when you have a huge amount of it. And North Korea has one of the biggest artillery forces anywhere in the world that's not on accident. The nation has an estimated 5,000 self-propelled artillery pieces alongside 5,000 towed howitzers. It's the second largest stock of each system anywhere in the world, outclassed only by Russia. Its multiple rocket launcher system fleet is the third largest on Earth, with nearly 3,000 of those systems in its arsenal. North Korean artillery doesn't even come close to modern American systems like precision-guided HIMARS or Excalibur-guided shells, but they don't have to. With thousands of guns ready to go at a moment's notice, precision becomes irrelevant when you overwhelm your enemy with huge volleys of saturation fire, and North Korea is prepared to do just that. In fact, they count on this artillery to secure victory in a new Korean war, and they have one massive trump card over the US and ROK alliance. 
The city of Seoul is one of the most modern and prosperous in the world. It's also within the range of North Korea's long-range artillery stationed along the DMZ. With several million inhabitants, Seoul has been the one weakness in every war plan developed by America and the ROK. Multiple times in the last 30 years, the United States has been prepared to launch strikes against North Korea to punish it for its nuclear program and to attempt to destroy it in place. Each time the South Koreans politely remind their American allies their capital was directly in range of North Korean guns. To counter the artillery threat, Seoul has built a large underground bunker system where its citizens can hide out for days if need be. They also have deployed significant counter-battery systems along the DMZ, with artillery units specifically trained and tasked with responding to northern fire and destroying the North's guns. The South Korean and U.S. Air Forces are both prepared for rapid response missions across the vast DMZ to eliminate northern batteries. But the North isn't ignorant to these plans, and it has its own in order to extend the survivability of its big guns. First, North Korea would immediately target Seoul with its longest-range guns. Equipped with incendiary munitions, the damage would be catastrophic, and not all civilians could hope to get to safety before the rounds started raining down around them. It's estimated that North Korea could deliver several thousand rounds in an hour to the city. Even with U.S. ROK counter-battery fire, an estimated 40% of the city would be destroyed in the opening hours of a new war, leading to catastrophic economic damage for the South. Second, North Korea is guaranteed to use various chemical and possibly even biological agents in the opening hours of its attack. With a fleet of an estimated 600 Scud missile launchers, North Korea would target ports, train stations, and airports with chemical and biological weapons in order to paralyze the South's transportation networks. The aim would be to make escape impossible for South Korean citizens. Much like Russia, North Korea views civilians as a legitimate target for war and a way to force its enemy into concessions. Trapping South Korean citizens in Seoul and other major cities would be of greater strategic value to the North than destroying ROK military facilities themselves. The North would attempt to negotiate for peace under its own terms by holding South Korea's citizens hostage, or at the very least, would seek to limit U.S. involvement. The United States would have to carefully weigh the global optics in its response to the North. If its involvement guarantees the death of hundreds of thousands or even millions of ROK citizens, it'll cost the U.S. politically and might even erode public support for intervention back home. Next, chemical weapons with persistent agents that can last for days would be used against the ROK and U.S. air bases near the DMZ. North Korean victory would rely on it quickly taking Seoul and then holding it hostage, forcing the South to sue for peace and the U.S. to stay away by threatening the death of millions of Seoul civilians. However, the biggest threat to this plan is Allied air power, and thus it would be critical to shut down airfields near the DMZ quickly as possible to prevent rapid response strikes. Persistent agents delivered via ballistic missiles would ensure that airfields remain inoperable and aircraft themselves require extensive decontamination efforts. Allied air power would be forced to fly from airfields further to the south or even completely out of the country for the U.S significantly slowing mission sortie rates and response times. Shutting down Allied air power is of critical importance to the North, because the terrain leading from the North to the South is very difficult, and large offensives could only take place via half a dozen or so routes through the hills and mountains. This would create a dangerous bottleneck of forces, which could be devastated by superior air power. Much as we saw retreating Iraqi forces annihilated by the infamous Highway of Death leading out of Kuwait. But even with runways operational, the Allies might have trouble flying strike missions against northern forces. The DMZ is home to a very dense network of northern air defenses, and while these are largely old Soviet-era models, as we've seen in Ukraine weapons like the S-300, it's still a significant threat to modern aircraft. The United States has tools to operate in such highly contested environments, but this would force it to rely on the F-22, F-35, and B-2 stealth bomber. The B-2 is too few in number to stem the tide of northern forces and would already be tasked with delivering decapitation strikes against the Kim regime and destroying its nuclear weapons infrastructure. This would leave the F-22 and the F-35 to respond, and neither aircraft is capable of bringing the type of firepower needed to stop a million-strong army equipped with over 6,000 tanks. Sure, North Korean tanks might be relics, but they are still tanks, and there's 6,000 of them most of which would be surging towards Seoul or fixing southern forces to prevent them reinforcing the Seoul Axis. What the U.S. and South Korea needs is the American B-52 bomber. This is the world's preeminent bomber aircraft, capable of bringing the pain in the form of 70,000 pounds of high explosives per aircraft. 
But it's the actual weapons that really matter here, and the United States Air Force has weapons specifically designed to devastate large armored formations. During the Second Gulf War, a single Marine recon platoon in unarmored Humvees ran into an entire Iraqi armored foundation. The Marines called in fire support from a loitering B-52, which dropped four CBU-97 cluster munitions. Inside each 1,000-pound bomb are 40 sensor-fused projectiles, known as skeets, which when dispersed over an area automatically target armored vehicles and destroy them from above. The Iraqi armored formation was immediately forced to retreat after losing approximately half of their vehicles in the first attack. These types of weapons which the US has in the thousands would devastate North Korean armored formations, but the United States would have to carefully weigh the costs. Without stealth, B-52s are nothing more than big bomb trucks and significantly threatened by even older ground-based air defenses. While B-52s in Vietnam showed they were able to deploy electronic countermeasures to dramatically increase their survivability and limit casualties while bombing the densest North Vietnamese air defense zones, the US would still have to carefully consider how much of its bomber fleet it's willing to sacrifice to try to stop Northern armor and if it would be even able to bring enough aircraft to the fight to do so. That's why the US would be limited to flying missions from outside of South Korea, basing these mighty B-52s from Japan and Guam. This limits how many of the aircraft can be brought and stored in theater, and dramatically lower sortie rates as the big bombers are forced to fly further. To further disrupt the Allies' response, North Korea would immediately deploy the largest special purpose forces in the world. With an estimated 60,000 Special Forces operators, Northern SOF would infiltrate the South in advance of any attack or immediately before one is launched. Dressed in civilian clothing or stolen ROK uniforms, North Korean Special Forces would conduct a massive campaign of sabotage and disruption, significantly complicating a military response by the South. And North Korea has multiple ways of getting its Special Forces into the South unseen even by sophisticated ROK and US surveillance tech. North Korea maintains a small fleet of biplanes. With canvas skin, these aircraft are throwbacks to World War I and of zero military threat to the South, except for one unique feature. Because they fly low, very slow, and have very few metal parts, these biplanes are incredibly difficult to locate and track with search radars, let alone target with modern air defense missiles. North Korean forces are trained to parachute out of these antiquated planes, and hundreds of them could probably manage the task even under cover of night. The second intrusion vector into the South would be via a fleet of many submarines that the North operates. Some of these are large enough to pose a threat to Allied ships, but many more are designed to take squads of soldiers past the 38th parallel and to the southern beaches. Operating in very shallow water, these small subs would basically be undetectable, and only vigorous beach patrols could hope to stop infiltration using these craft, diverting badly needed manpower from the war spilling across the DMZ. On the DMZ itself, though, North Korea has yet another infiltration vector, though it's not known just how active it remains today. Throughout the 90s, the ROK forces discovered multiple tunnels that the North had dug right under the DMZ. Some of these were big enough to allow for an estimated 3,200 soldiers to pour through them per hour, completely bypassing the dense defenses of the DMZ itself. Such a force could wreak havoc behind enemy lines, and while they would be largely engaging in suicide attacks, heavy indoctrination has prepared North Korean special forces for the sacrificial task. No new tunnels have been discovered since the 2000s, but that doesn't mean they haven't been built. Disruption is the name of the game for North Korea, and of its strategic goals in the invasion of the South, none is more important than knocking the US out of the fight and keeping it out. To achieve this, North Korea needs to shut down major southern ports, which would allow for the offloading of large amounts of American troops and equipment. The US could surge several thousand light infantry via its large air transport fleet, but bringing America's mighty armored division into the fight would require approximately 60 days. This would leave the North with just under two months to shut down the South's major ports. Normally, incoming reinforcements would be better intercepted at sea. North Korea does have a small fleet of diesel submarines, but these subs have short ranges and are not very sophisticated. They would be better used laying silently in ambush to attempt to intercept ROK and US naval forces pushing north past the DMZ to unleash volleys of cruise missile attacks. Even then, they would not survive for long up against both fleets' anti-submarine assets. Instead, North Korea would need to shut down the port facilities themselves. This is where the use of chemical weapons would once more come into play, with the aim of contaminating disembarking points for US troops. The US and South Korea have formidable air defenses, including the Patriot Air Defense System, but North Korea is prepared to launch massive volleys of ballistic missiles in order to overwhelm the southern air defense network. 
and amongst those incoming ballistic missiles would inevitably be multiple nuclear weapons. It's believed that by now the North has miniaturized its arsenal of a few dozen nuclear weapons, enough to load on medium-range missiles. It might even be able to threaten the west coast of the United States itself, but the North's nukes are better suited for knocking out port facilities and military airfields in the South. The Kim regime is likely fully prepared to do so, as there is no chance that the Kim family would survive a failed war. Not only do both the US and South Korea have decapitation strike plans in place, using bombers, cruise missiles, and special forces to eliminate the Kims on the onset of the war, but a failed war to reunify the South with the North could end up in catastrophic and apocalyptic defeat for the North. Many in the higher echelons of power in Pyongyang would eliminate the Kim regime long before American Abrams and South Korean K-2 tanks started rolling into the city. For North Korea, the outbreak of war is an all-or-nothing affair with national survival at stake. The use of nuclear weapons is thus naturally assumed. Since Kim Jong-un's rise to power in 2011, defections in North Korea have plummeted dramatically. Today, North Korea has become a veritable fortress, a nation-sized jail from which you cannot escape. In 2011, the year of Kim Jong-il's death, there were 2,706 North Korean defectors. The very next year, that number dropped to 1,502. In 2020, there were only 229 defectors. If you listen to North Korean propaganda, those plummeting numbers are due to Kim Jong-un's brilliant leadership turning the nation into a lush garden of prosperity where nobody wants to defect. The reality is much crueler. Autocratic, despotic governments face their greatest threat to survival during regime changes, and Kim Jong-un was keenly aware of this fact. Even before formally assuming power, Un was already establishing himself as the legitimate ruler and heir to his father, maneuvering potential rivals out of positions of power and consolidating his alliances with the traditional North Korean habit of gift-giving. Lavish gifts are displays of favor in North Korea and promises of future favor from the halls of power. However, upon the death of his father, Un moved quickly to consolidate his position as legitimate ruler of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. This included a number of very high-profile purges, including some family members and senior positions of power. All of these purges were carried out under the guise of punishing corruption or traitors to the North Korean state. But much like the famous anti-corruption purges carried out in China by President Xi Jinping, this was merely a cover for elimination of political rivals. The truth is, Kim Jong-un was knocking out anybody that could be a threat to his power. But almost immediately upon taking power, Un had another serious problem. North Korean defectors. A transition of power presents an opportunity for anybody looking to replace a current government, even through military force. And Un now had to worry about the United States using this opportunity to remove him by force. To avoid this, he needed to project the image to the world that North Korea was firmly under his control, and even more importantly, that it was a happy and prosperous place under his leadership. The US wouldn't dare depose him by force if the nation was stable and prosperous, and while the US never had any such plans, the paranoid mind of Kim Jong-un fed him constant fears of losing his newly acquired power. The best way to repair North Korea's image was to deny South Korea its biggest weapon against it, North Korean defectors. During his father's reign, North Korea had seen steady rising numbers of defectors who would inevitably show up on South Korea's media to denounce the North and tell the world about the real state of affairs within the nation. This counter-propaganda even reached citizens in the North who had illegal satellite internet connections or radios able to pick up powerful broadcasts aimed directly at the North from the South. Secure in his power, Kim Jong-il showed practically no concern for the rising number of counter-propagandists and defectors in the South. But Kim Jong-un couldn't afford not to care. One of the first things he did was tighten up security along the DMZ. In the past, defectors have been able to navigate the myriad stretches of barbed wire and thousands of landmines to get to the safety in the South. However, he needed to do this in a way that wouldn't provoke the South to increase its own military presence. He increased the number of border patrols only modestly both to avoid provoking the South and its American allies, but also because of the simple fact that most DMZ defections were of border guards themselves. Placing more of them on the border would only increase the rate of defection, not decrease it. So instead, he focused on improving border security infrastructure, including replacing old fences and reinforcing new ones. Vehicle barriers were also upgraded to stop defectors from ramming through security barricades and speeding to the South, as had been done numerous times before. However, while the DMZ was the most direct route out of North Korea for defectors, it actually wasn't the most widely used one. The heavy security presence made it almost impossible for civilians to approach, leaving it mostly used only by military defectors who were already present at the border or could more easily pretend to have a reason to be there. 
Instead, North Korea's greatest avenue for defectors has always been its long-shared border with China. That border with China is just over 880 miles long and largely uses either the Yalu or Tumen River as a physical marker of where the two borders meet. This border has 25 official crossings where one can leave North Korea and enter China and is a lifeline for the Hermit Kingdom. Through China, North Korea is able to access world markets, and while China is technically supposed to clamp down on the legal trade across its border, it largely looks the other way on North Korean smuggling, including even at times the smuggling of weapons for sale to other developing countries. Such trade is a critical economic lifeline for North Korea, and the last thing China wants is North Korea to fall and a pro-American South Korean-led reunification of the continent. But while these crossings make the moving of both legitimate trade goods and contraband easy for North Korea, they are very heavily secured and any North Korean wanting to enter China needs official permission and is thoroughly vetted by security officials. Sneaking through the heavily patrolled and secured border crossings is all but impossible, so instead defectors have turned to the largely unsecured countryside. There, defectors had traditionally been able to paddle across the river and into China in homemade rafts, or at other times they were met by international helpers using motorboats. Civilian traffic along the river is not prohibited, though Chinese boaters are warned to stay away from the North Korean side of the river and never ever make landfall on North Korea. All this started to change in the mid-2000s, as the mounting numbers of North Korean defectors put domestic political pressure on the Beijing government. South Korean defectors also made China's close relationship with the Hermit Kingdom an international liability, and as China began to assert itself on the world stage, North Korea's anti-propagandist defector problem was now China's problem as well. To remedy this, China changed the responsibility of the border from local police forces to the military and undertook an extensive program of border security. This included the installation of dozens of miles of high-security fencing and concrete barriers along the most popular defection routes. It also increased the number of patrols, leveraging the vast manpower of the Chinese army, and implemented harsh measures to deal with North Korean defectors that to many were reminders of pro-slavery federal laws from the mid-19th century America. These new laws included the immediate and forcible removal of any illegal North Korean immigrants in the nation, and harsh punishments for those caught harboring or aiding North Korean defectors. But even with these increased security measures, such a vast border is practically impossible to secure, and many visitors to the area have reported that in many places it still seems as if a border crossing would be relatively easy to accomplish. So why then are North Korean defectors increasingly more rare since 2011? One of the first things Kim Jong-un did was to improve the security situation along the Chinese border, and this included better oversight of the border guards already present. For decades, these guards were easily bribed by defectors and smugglers alike, creating a culture of extreme, almost commonplace corruption. If you could afford even a meager bribe of money or food, most border guards would happily turn a blind eye. They too, after all, were largely suffering from impoverished living conditions. Food especially could be an astonishingly low supply for most North Korean troops, leading many to establishing official and unofficial farming operations of their own. While North Korean generals get cash cards as gifts to ensure their loyalty, most conscripted soldiers have to scrape by with a meager living. This laxness towards security changed when Kim Jong-un took power, however, with more firebrand officers being moved to the border regions to enforce better discipline. Punishments for soldiers caught taking bribes also became tougher. While before, local officers would be worked into the system of bribes and receive their cut, so to speak, not unlike a mob operation, these new measures punished even senior officers caught taking bribes. Roads were also built to facilitate security patrols into previously hard-to-reach areas, and military river patrols also became much more common. North Korea undertook its own fence-building program, but ran into the same difficulties and financial costs as China when trying to secure such a vast border. In the end, no amount of security measures could ever actually stop the flow of defectors out of the nation. Instead, more focus was turned inward. Would-be defectors were publicly punished as a warning to others. The punishment was often a life sentence in one of North Korea's not-so-secret gulag-style prison camps. In these brutal camps, inmates are worked to death and fed little to no food, so even a less-than-life sentence typically ends in death for the condemned. However, under North Korean law, up to three generations of a family can be punished for a single crime, meaning that a defector could be condemning not just themselves, but their parents and children to life imprisonment in a brutal prison camp. Ostensibly, this practice is part of North Korea's ideology of it taking three generations to root out evil, but in truth it's merely another harsh punishment tactic meant to keep civilian populations in line. However, during Kim Jong-un's regime, 
defectors outside of North Korea were increasingly being invited back into the country. North Korean agents would frequently make contact with defectors in the South, even going so far as to promise no punishment for themselves or their families, free housing, a good job, and a cash sum worth up to 44,000 US dollars. This was part of Kim Jong-un's counter-propaganda strategy. And while few took this offer, those that did soon found themselves on North Korean television singing the praises of the supreme leader and denouncing the living conditions outside the nation. Why would anyone choose to return to such an oppressive state, though? Well, while North Korean defectors may have found freedom in the South, they often faced extreme challenges in finding employment. Most are relatively unskilled or poorly educated, making them suitable only for very low-income jobs. This is on top of the same prejudice that immigrants face everywhere around the world. And while they do receive a government stipend to help them start a new life, the stipend is itself very meager. Facing financial hardships and very likely homesick for a family they left behind and will never see again, some defectors are glad to take up the North's offer of amnesty in exchange for being used as a propaganda tool. But the real reason why today you can't escape from North Korea has to do with the same recent events that have rocked the entire planet. COVID-19. Unlike many nations around the world, North Korea has taken the COVID virus very seriously and implemented very stringent measures restricting movement of the population. As the nation is currently teetering on the verge of the worst famine in three decades, it has been forced to act to limit the health disaster of a full-blown COVID outbreak. And given the authoritarian nature of the government to begin with, implementing full-scale movement restrictions of the civilian population has been relatively easy. This has made it all but impossible for defectors to make the long and difficult journey to the border crossing areas from their hometowns. And while in 2019 over a thousand people defected, just a year later 2020 barely saw 230 make it out of the country. That figure is expected to remain equally low at the end of 2021, though it'll be some time before we have an official count as the process of actually defecting often involves a journey lasting up to six months through Southeast Asia. Now go check out 50 insane facts about North Korea you didn't know, or click this other video instead.